All right, Corbin, can you confirm that uh, you're able to speak and contribute? Okay, can you hear me? Yep, there you are. Perfect. Yeah, go ahead and turn turn off camera for now. We'll uh, bring those back up after the pledge. But all right, it is five thirty. So I will call to order this. Uh, whoops, let me back up a little bit. It's five thirty. I'll call to order um, city council meeting for tonight, Wednesday, April first, twenty twenty. Tonight is a little bit different. Obviously, we're meeting electronically uh, through a webinar. Um, not exactly what we had anticipated when we set, our, uh, when we set out our uh, calendar for the year, but we'll make do as best that we can. So I thank the council uh, staff and the public that are participating for their patience as we try to figure out how to adapt to current circumstances. One of the first things we wanna to do tonight on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. And I've noticed that other municipalities have skipped the pledge. Um, I did a little bit of checking and it looks like the, it looks like it's acceptable to proceed with a Pledge of Allegiance without a flag. Obviously the preference is to have one there, but um, I, I feel like we'd be remiss if we proceeded tonight without having the pledge. So we'll let a uh, picture of the flag stand in for the time being. And then we've asked council member Green to lead us in the pledge. So council member Green, if you will. As typical, I would ask everybody wherever they're at to stand up and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, council member Green. With that, I'd invite those who are participating in the meeting this evening to go ahead and start your video um, so that you can be seen. Just did not want to take away from uh, or introduce any unnecessarily distractions as we continue with the pledge. Next item up, Council Member Green, I'll turn to you again for this one, um, because as he noted in our code, there's actually a section of our code that says, only council members may participate electronically from remote locations. No other person may participate electronically in a city council meeting unless a motion's made and approved by the city council during that meeting. So with that, I would open it up to, uh, to a motion. So uh, I will make that motion. Due to requirements in West Jordan City Ordinance, I move that all persons listed on the agenda and any other individual called upon by the council chair may participate in this council meeting. I'll second the motion. Any discussion to the motion? All right, I don't believe we need a roll call vote for this. Therefore, I will ask all in favor to say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, well, we will proceed then with the meeting allowing everyone to participate electronically. All right, so you'll also notice on tonight's agenda, we did not have agendized an option for citizen comments. When we started putting things together, we were a little bit worried about the technology, this being a first run, so we didn't want to commit to something that we weren't sure that we were going to be able to deliver on. That said, we think we found a reasonable way to allow for uh, citizen comments so even though it's not on the agenda, I would ask if the council is supportive of holding or of allowing a portion of tonight's meeting for citizen comments anyway, should there be somebody who wishes to make a comment. Council Member Pack, is that you looking to make a motion? Uh, yes, I move to be able to allow citizen comments so that they can participate in the public governance process. And is there a second? I'll second. Yeah. Second from Council Member Jacob. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. All right, so like I said, we're doing things a little bit different tonight. So citizen comments, rather than starting right now with citizen comments, we're going to wait until after we've done communications from staff and from Council. 
If there's anybody watching online who'd like to join us, you will have a minute or two to get into the meeting so that you can participate live. Um, there's the information up on the screen on how to join. You would go in to Zoom, uh, enter the meeting number, enter the password. Make sure you enter your actual name as you, as you come into the meeting. When you're admitted to the meeting, you'll be admitted as an attendee. Attendees are only able to listen. We can't, uh, you're not able to speak. You're not able to have any video or anything like that. What will happen when we get to citizen comments uh, a little bit later in the meeting, I'll ask you to click the little hand icon at the bottom of the screen so we can see who would like to speak. And then we'll go through and anybody that wishes will be unmuted for your allotted time. And then you can speak to any item that's on the agenda or not on the agenda. Really, it's your opportunity to be heard by the city council. If you don't have the ability to join through the computer, you do also have the ability to join by phone, although computer would very much be encouraged. You've got any one of these five phone numbers that you could call in. It will ask for a meeting ID and then a password. The downside of participating by phone is we can't see who's wanting to participate in citizen comments and who's just wanting to listen. Therefore, we'll have to go through and every phone number that we see on there, we'll just have to go through each by probably identify you by the last four of your phone number and ask if you'd like to speak, unmute you, and then you can let us know. So the preference would be if you'd like to participate in, in citizen comments, please join by computer and then uh, we'll be able to help you out from there. When you join by computer, even if you don't have a headset or earbuds, it will give you a phone number that you can call in so it can sync up the web session with the phone so we can still see who you are. So um, please, if you can, go with that option and we'll come to citizen comments here shortly. That said, we will proceed with communications. Here's uh, what we're looking for com for communications today. So we will start with the mayor's report. Um, mayor Burton, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Council Chair McConaughey. It's kind of different doing it this way, but it's a pleasure to be meeting again. It's been nearly a month since we last met with the council, and it's been quite the month, I might add. Two days after our meeting, in coordination with local leadership, we took steps to encourage all of our employees at City Hall to work at home. So they're tele telecommuting, as they call it, and that's reduced traffic coming to City Hall. Corbin will tell you more of the details when it's his turn to talk about how that looks for each department. But let me tell you, the departments have been very good at doing this and we've been, been able to continue to do the work of the city, even though they're not here at City Hall. And they've handled that very well. So I've been very pleased with our staff and the way they've taken this. We've also taken a few additional steps since our last meeting to help manage this uh, pandemic including closing down our playgrounds and our efforts to help digitalize more of our city services. So we've been making some changes and some of these changes are good and we may just continue them even after we get back into, after our normal life, how you want to word that. So today, based on the progress we've made, we have made the decision to issue a soft closure at City Hall. So probably just the next level. So what that means is our other buildings are closed. If public wants to go there, there'll be a sign on the door, the phone number in case you need to contact somebody in there. That doesn't mean we're still not doing the work of the city and taking care of our citizens. It just means that we're not in the buildings and not accepting walk-ins to help cause some problems. So starting Monday morning, our buildings will be closed to walk-ins, all of them will. We'll have a skeleton staff available in the building to handle on the spot issues and take appointments. So if you get there and you need somebody, there'll be a phone number you can call and we'll still take care of what those needs are. We're hoping that you won't need to come here, that you could do it electronically and not even have to make the trip over here and keep yourself safer. Now making decisions like this is not easy. They haven't been made lightly. We've had lots of discussions and conversations about it. And the way that the economic impact on closures is very concerning to me being a small business owner. I'm very concerned about our small businesses during this time. So while I'm doing everything in my power to assist the local business and their operations, I also have to make sure that they are safe and that everyone working here at City Hall is safe. 
So I want to share with you a couple of examples on how the current situation has affected some of these people that work in the city. For example, in our fire department, they get to meet different people in every call they make every time. So there's some concerns that they don't want to bring that disease home to their family. So we have a firefighter who, because he's concerned on not sharing with his family the disease, he is currently living in a travel trailer on his property to ensure that he doesn't bring the germs into his home. In our attorney's office, we have an employee named Tana who, upon hearing the concerns of her fellow team members, sold face masks for each of them on her own time. In community engagement and public works, we have employees who are currently on quarantine, awaiting the results of their test, which makes those who they had been working with a little anxious. But we have no confirmed cases as of yet. I tell you these stories not to worry you, but to share with you how committed our employees are for their jobs. Our staff is, is really stepping up to the task here. And their team and everyone who works with them in West Jordan and make things happen without interruption. Your trash is still getting picked up just like it always has. You turn the faucet on, you still get your water so you can still wash your hands. On a separate note, I wanna share with you that we just learned today that one of our officers who was involved in the shooting back in July of 2019. Well, the Attorney General, Sim Gill, has now cleared him. And so his work was justified and he is back on the force and doing the work as he did in the past. The city goes forth, the work goes forth. We're all doing it differently, but we're still making progress and good things continue to happen. Thank, me, thank you for your time, Council and Council Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, next, we have the CAO's report. Uh, Corbin Lee. Okay, thank you, council members. Um, I just wanna give you an update on, on how our operations are going uh, during this time of uh, uh, social distancing and work from home. Uh, let me give you a quick rundown of each department, what they're doing and how they're responding to this current situation. Um, it seems fitting to start with our information technology department. They've been very, very busy, very diligent, helping as many office workers and employees in, across the city work from home as possible. Um, they've been setting up systems for us to meet virtually, uh, digitally, and they've been very successful with that. In many cases, we're seeing some increased productivity in different parts of the city. Our, our IT staff are all working remotely and they're trying to adjust to supporting um, a workforce that's largely uh, working remotely. In the legal department, all the employees are working remotely in their homes. The prosecutors are working with the court to accommodate matters that the court determines must have an in-person hearing. Um, they're handling matters that can be resolved without a court appearance by, uh, if, if it can be done digitally, they are taking care of it uh, with some electronic means such as telephone or online. Uh, text and email, working with defense attorneys and so on. In our public works department, the capital, uh, capital improvement group, the um, GIS departments are entirely working from home. Um, all of the operating departments outside of those two in public works are conducting business as usual, but we're not taking on any big projects right now and working very hard to practice social distancing uh, finding ways to reduce the number of times that employees are uh, traveling in similar vehicles to job sites and so on. In administrative services, the entire department's working from home. Um, some of the department, uh, like utility payments, in fact, um, are finding they're very productive while working at home and uh, they've had a good transition there. In the community engagement department, the entire department is working from home as well. The customer service window is staffed with one person. The mayor talked about the soft closure. We're gonna work on transitioning with that soft closure for all phone calls to be routed directly to those working from home and getting a live answer immediately so that we, uh, although we're not as customer service oriented face-to-face -face during this time, we become more customer service oriented over the phone and through email. In the police department, any staff who can work remotely, they are doing so. 
Uh, we've divided the records and detectives divisions into two groups and they're working opposite schedules in the facility to minimize um, contact among the different groups and to reduce the chance of uh, infection spreading throughout an entire division. Patrol officers are doing well. We've not reduced any services except for fingerprinting. Um, the officers are very kind and patient, encouraging on the public health order and uh, supporting the county and the state's efforts, but trying to do so in a very customer service oriented way and a very supportive and educational way. In development services, code enforcement, business licensing, real property staff are all working from home currently. About half the planning and half the engineering staff are working from home as well. And we're transitioning this next week to uh, increase that as well. Uh, the development services staff certainly aren't slowing down, however. Um, for example, the total valuation of the work that's been done in the first nine months of this, uh, of this fiscal year was $352 million of valuation. That's, a, that's the highest, that's a record. It's the highest they've done in, in 2000. The total valuation was about 267 million. So there's a lot of value um, in terms of built property being added to the city that our development services staff are working through. Um, the number of non-residential building permits that they have issued has uh, had a total square footage of 2.1 million square feet in the nine month period. That's almost double what our prior record was for an entire year. Um, so you can see it's, and it's, it's a very, very busy time for development services. And it's an area where we're trying to serve that, serve the public, serve the contractors and uh, the customers the best way we possibly can while maintaining social distancing and while operating with uh, limited staff or limited face-to-face -face contact. Fire department's working very, very hard. They've adopted a few changes to protocols of being very careful with PPEs and their social contact with patients um, and are working very, very diligently to serve the public. So that's it for me, council. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your willingness to meet and your uh, flexibility for holding this meeting electronically. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I, I do have one quick question for you, or one quick uh, clarification, where you mentioned the, it is good to hear that our officer was cleared. Uh, just to clarify, was that the, rather AG, but was that the district attorney that issued the clearance? Correct, the district attorney. Okay. Yes. Cool, just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Tani Baker with a legislative summary session. Barker. Or Barker. <sighs> Crazy day. Apologies, Tani. Let's see. You know what? She is there as an attendee and hasn't been moved to panelist. That is two strikes in a row for me. <laughs> My apologies. Let me see if we can get her moved over here real quick. Promote to panelist. There we go. It should have taken it. All right, now Tani should be here as a panelist now. Tani, you'll just need to unmute yourself and you should be good to go. So your video flicker, but it looks like your uh, audio is still on mute. <laughs> Uh, my, my video apparently doesn't want you guys to see me today, but I'll, I'll continue <laughs> nonetheless. I'm here, I promise. Beautiful, and <laughs> we can hear you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, council, councilman. Um, uh, a couple of things. I, I want to start by providing you guys with a, a brief grandma request update simply because I know it's one that's come to all of your attention and has required all of your attention. Um, earlier today, we closed out the uh, December 30th grandma request from Jonathan Rogers. Uh, we fulfilled the request in January. We provided an opportunity for Mr. Rogers to come and pick up the documents he requested. Um, he has not picked those documents up and has continued to ask questions about the project. We engaged the state ombudsman a couple of weeks ago to try to um, help answer his questions, um, mediate his concerns. At, at this time, Mr. Rogers has determined that he does not want to work with the mediator or work with the city further on this. 
The information he has requested will remain available at City Hall for pickup at any time. Um, the documentation he received was a total cost of 1809, so quite affordable for the volume of documents requested. And wanted to make sure that you guys were all aware the documents were here. The state ombudsman has closed their case. They feel like the city of West Jordan has fulfilled Mr. Rogers' request to uh, the extent possible and that he is choosing not to uh, pick, pick those uh, responses up. And so just wanted to share that with you because I know many of you have received emails from Mr. Rogers. Um, any questions before I move on to a legislative update? Okay, great. Well, I'm excited to tell you a little bit about the legislature. It, it only ended about a month ago, but it sure feels like it's been about a year ago. <laughs> so wanted to provide you guys with an update of some of our successes and some of the things that we're working on. You'll remember a couple of months ago when I first came to you, it was to provide you with some of the goals that we'd be working towards as the city. The first goal that we really set forward for ourselves was to do a good job of networking with other cities, establish a voice for West Jordan, and really just be present at the legislature and in legislative events. I'm pleased to report to you today that that did occur and went well um, with the support of many people in our office, including uh, the mayor who was very active up on the Hill this year, um, our city attorney, Rob Wall, who was very generous in lending his time and expertise both um, to myself and the mayor, as well as the league and uh, lending the expertise of a few of his attorneys as well. And then uh, your own David Bricky, who assisted and, and attended meetings with, up, uh, with us up on the Hill. Um, we did establish a voice. We participated this year, not only as a member of the league's policy, uh, with seats on the league's policy team, um, which included council member um, Jacob, the mayor and myself, but we also participated in the league's small group. Um, where we helped guide league decisions and had a critical voice there. So we were really excited and uh, pleased with the efforts that were made on that front. We did have a few wins this year. Um, we, we set a goal to work on transportation for the city. And I feel like we had one really big win and a sort of okay. Uh, the really big win was that we were able to work with Senator Harper to remove the cap on TODs. I know there's been a lot of interest in having a TOD right here across the street from City Hall off Redwood Road. And when we've applied for that in the past, it hasn't come through uh, because there was a cap and because other things were pr being prioritized above uh, that potential TOD. So we're excited to be moving forward on that. And in fact, met with uh, some of our lobbyists to discuss what that looks like going forward just today. Um, an area where we didn't see quite as much success as we'd like, but we're gonna to continue to work in the interim was with the transportation bond we hope to have passed for Mountain View Corridor as well as Bacchus Highway. Unfortunately, uh, the legislature decided at the very, very last minute, and when I say last minute, I mean last hour of last minute of <laughs> last day of the session to not move forward with the bond. We will continue to, uh, work on our efforts to lobby and encourage them to bond on those roads so that we can improve regional transportation in the area. We do anticipate that there may be an opportunity for this in interim sessions and are, are looking forward to that. We're in the process right now of doing our legislative wrap up where we pull together all of the bills and items that passed and assign those out to the different departments as they're applicable. As you can imagine, uh, we've been a little waylaid by some of the things that we're doing and um, haven't had quite the, quite the chance to um, get that out as early as we would have liked, but um, see that forthcoming shortly and, and you all will receive a copy of that as well. Uh, the last thing I would like to note is just a little bit about what we expect in terms of interim this year. Um, as you can imagine, the legislature is very concerned about the budget. They're anticipating a budget cut of approximately 10% to the state budget this year um, after a year where they were already quite concerned over their ability to pay for things. Um, we anticipate that they will be called back into session sometime uh, probably around the last week of April, although it may be the first week of May. Uh, the legislative staff has already made recommendations to the legislature on areas that they may be able to cut funding and or help deal with the COVID crisis. I'm going to just bring up three of those things as they, I, I believe they affect the city and they will be things that we'll be opposing moving forward. 
The first is the suggestion that they might delay the payment of property tax um, and allow people to pay their property taxes later on. Obviously that as a big revenue source for the city, that would be a real challenge for us as a municipality, um, particularly when many people pay these, um, have these funds set aside in escrow. So they're already pulled out of their mortgage for the year. Um, that could end up being a real challenge that benefits no one outside of the mortgage company or bank that is holding those funds in escrow. So that's one thing that we're very concerned about and will likely oppose. Um, having said that, we'll be looking for opportunities to support those who live on a fixed income and may have a different situation and don't have quite the funding in escrow. One of the other things that we're looking at is um, there's been a proposal to uh, temporarily remove the transient room tax as a way to encourage uh, uh, tourism spending in the future as, as well as general spending. Again, that would be a hit to our budget. So we're quite concerned and we'll be watching that. And finally, there are some recommendations uh, for additional policies, procedures, and uh, a, a few administrative um, projects that would be placed upon us based on, uh, in, in terms of our utilities. Um, they're quite costly and we're looking to avoid moving forward with that because as I know you're all aware, not only is the state challenged in their budget, but so are we. So as the state kind of passes this down, um, the municipalities at, at times, if, if they go with some of these, will have to bear that burden. So those are the things that we're looking at right now. We are looking forward to meeting with uh, our lobbyists to discuss these issues and uh, make sure we're well represented as we move into this challenging uh, potential interim session that could occur at the end of the month, beginning of May. Any questions? Great, thank you. Thanks, Tani. And then next up we have Jared Smith providing us an update. So give me just a moment here and I'm going to change Jared's role over to panelist. All right, Jared, your turn. We can't hear you yet. Yeah, like there you I are. Did, let me myself. Okay, thank you, City Council. Just wanted to give you an update on the city's response to, first of all, the um, pandemic, the COVID pandemic, and then uh, later on the earthquake. What we've been doing from the early stages and with the leadership from our administration, um, very forward thinking and trying to make sure that we're able to respond to all of the incidents uh, incidents as they happen. Uh, the first one that happened was the pandemic, and then this one has been rolling forth. Uh, as we kind of watch this one rolling, rolling in like a like a dark cloud. Um, we started to take action. Started to meet very early on under the administration with Corbin and the mayor. Um, the earliest concerns that the mayor had um, in managing this incident was first of all to make sure that we were um, not shutting down economic the economic engine of the city too early, and so. His concern was in making sure that we were able to keep business rolling as, as long as possible throughout the city. And I think the city has, has um, responded well. We've tried to certainly um, maintain as much services to the city as we possibly can. And so we continue to, uh, as our mission focus, maintain our services to the city as, um, as, as much as possible. Um, there, there might be some questions from residents or city council or from city council on what the city did or why it took so long to declare a state of emergency and, and in those meetings um you know long meetings we had uh we wanted to make sure that we were doing what was best for the city with the knowledge that we had and, and with the purposes of declaring a state of emergency so, emergency something that the mayor and corbin took very seriously before doing so um you know a few days after we went into a state of emergency under the coronavirus um corbin recommended that we um, activate the emergency operations center. We went kind of to a soft activation with the emergency operations center and set up a emergency operations center at City Hall. We're grateful that we were able to do so um, because when the earthquake hit on the morning of uh, uh, whatever morning it was, Wednesday the, the, the uh, 21st, I believe, or somewhere there about, or, or actually the 17th, um, St. Patrick's Day, um, we were able to respond very quickly. The earthquake came in at um, and just after seven o'clock in the morning, 
our first call with the emergency operations center with everybody um, happened around 7:30, and we were able to start getting status reports and updates and corman's first initial concern was getting a status report make sure we had situation awareness with the city uh, making sure we knew where the damage was and we had immediately we had all the staff operations staff did a great job knowing what they were supposed to do in and um, in that situation they went out they checked the streets they checked the bridges they checked the main infrastructure of the city certainly the water supply and making sure there was no damage to any of the water vaults or the tanks. Um, so we, information came in pretty quickly that there was no damage to the city. By about 11 o'clock, we felt confident that there wasn't a, um, a lot of damage to city infrastructure. Uh, another action that we took was to reach out to um, to try to determine uh, what the assessment was in the residents with the with the residents of the city. And so we reached out to our partner with the LDS Church to just get a quick assessment to see if there was any damage. Um, they got back pretty quickly to us by about one o'clock in the afternoon that they weren't getting any reports of damage and that, that for the most part, the city was all clear. Um, our building inspectors did go to um, some of the different um, agencies, some of the different buildings as they got calls in, some of the different commercial um, structures. Um, you, know, you know, our first concern after our, the city's infrastructure was the hospital, making sure that the hospital was in good standing. Um, the hospital had their own contractor that was out uh, really early on, making sure that they were <clears throat> able to take care and just to inspect the, the hospital, make sure there wasn't any damage to the hospital. So we got we got pretty early on um, throughout the day by 11, well, I would say by one o'clock in the afternoon, we felt confident that there wasn't a lot of damage or hardly any damage if any, to any of the infrastructure, the buildings, residences, commercial buildings uh, throughout the city after the earthquake. Um, certainly Pioneer Hall was one of our, I think Pioneer Hall is going to be our, our test case in any um, earthquake. If Pioneer Hall is still standing and, and no damage to Pioneer Hall, then I think the rest of the city is going to be okay. So um, continuing on with the coronavirus, so um, uh, we were very busy on, the, on, on w that Wednesday after the earthquake, reaching out and coordinating with, this, with the county, um, the County Emergency Operations Center trying to coordinate um, any damage or any, any needs that, that the city would have. Um, and so we spent the, spent the majority of that day just working on the earthquake and just making sure that we had all the resources we had to. The county uh, as a whole took on a lot more damage than the city did um, through Salt Lake County, um, through Salt Lake City, and um, you know, there is the Magna and out west that had quite a bit of damage. And so the, the county is doing a lot more um, damage assessment and getting a lot more damage reviews there. Uh, another thing that um, after, so after the earthquake that we went back to handling the pandemic, and this has just been a very, very, very slow wave rolling across the, uh, the, across the country. We're in a, kind of in a waiting mode, waiting for our peak to hit in Utah. We don't have the same densities that we have um, that you see in some of these bigger cities where in the urban centers, um, where they're getting overwhelmed, the hospitals and some of the stories that certainly here at coming out of New York, although we anticipate that um, that could happen here. And so all preparations are being made to make sure we can handle a surge um, what, in the same kind of uh, percentages that they're seeing in some of these urban centers. So, um, but from the outset, our biggest concern, our biggest shortage has been in getting supplies and managing the supplies for uh, first responders make sure that they have the, the, the right cleaning equipment, the right PPE, or sorry, personal protective equipment to make sure that they can respond appropriately to any disaster or any of, of the pandemic. Um, we're grateful that it's not as bad as we see in other areas. We're grateful that we've been able to get, um, at least for now, we feel pretty confident for the next 30 days that we have enough uh, medical supplies. Although, um, you know, we are very careful with how we handle our medical supplies. And then from, from there, uh, now the biggest lift with the pandemic is going to be managing and tracking our expenses, as you probably are aware, you know, with the $2.2 trillion um, CARES Act that Congress passed, there's about $45 million billion appropriated to, to states um, responding to the pandemic. And so we anticipate that the state will be able to get a little bit of, um, they'll be able to get some of that money. And so our responsibility is making sure that we're tracking all of our expenditures adequately and appropriately. And we tracked all that, we've documented that, and that's our, really our biggest lift. And the further from that, and one of the mayor's top priorities is making sure that we're taking care of the economic um, 
livelihood of the city. And as soon as we can, we're going to transition out of the emergency response phase and get back and, and look into and, and really dive into the emergency recovery phase. And um, that's something that we're, we're, we're ramping up to do and getting ready to do. So that is my update. Uh, happy to answer any questions about the earthquake or the pandemic response so far. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jared. Next up, we have our council office report. So uh, Mr. Bricky and Mr. Anderson. Thank you, uh, Chair, Council. I'm going to tell you it's frankly been a really challenging week setting up all of the procedures so this works and the public can see what's going on. Uh, at the forefront of how that has been uh, implemented is Mr. Anderson. I'm going to ask if he could please share with uh, the community and you council as a whole just what he's had to go through. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, council. Um, as you know, there's a lot of planning that has to go into a um, putting on an event like a council meeting virtually. Um, it included uh, getting public meeting notices out for the next meetings and getting those uh, meetings scheduled as well so that we could put the meeting ID on the public meeting notice as the public is notified about those hearings of different development projects within the city. Uh, IT, as has been mentioned by uh, Mr. Lee, has uh, been phenomenal in getting uh, the technology set up so we could do this through Zoom. Um, we have uh, just watching the YouTube stream right now to make sure that that's uh, functioning properly. Um, we have 15 people that are watching it right now. Uh, IT also helped us with the council comment line. So we have a 24 hour council comment line for the city council as well as the council comments at westjordan.utah.gov uh, in addition to the Zoom. So uh, we feel like we're meeting the intent of the Open Meetings Act uh, by providing multiple opportunities for the public to uh, speak to the council, to each of you with their concerns. Um, and uh, I'm glad that it's uh, working well so far. Thank you. All right, Any, anything else from council office? No, sir, thank you for asking. All right, well, we will move on to city council comments and I will just go through the order that everybody's little boxes show up on my screen. So I'll start off with uh, council member Green. Feel free, you don't necessarily have to take yourself off mute if you uh, don't have anything, you can shake your head no, but uh, do you have anything for council comments tonight? Uh... No, I don't have any comments for council comments tonight. I was thinking I might, but I think I'll wait and we have some discussions offline on one. Okay, thank you. Next up, council member Whitelock. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sure can. Great. I just want to thank the residents for um, conducting themselves in an orderly manner and being kind to one another. I've seen a lot of things on social media of people helping each other and working together in our community because that will be the best way for all of us to get through this. So I just wanted to thank the residents for their work as well as our employees that together we can, we can do anything. So let's stay together. Thank you. Council member Lamb. I'm not able to see on camera. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? Sure can. Perfect. I just want to think, I want to take the opportunity to thank the citizens as well. You know, it's been what, 20 days since Rudy Gobert uh, was told that he had a uh, coronavirus and they shut the NBA down. And then shortly after that, that's when <laughs> the rest of the country seemed to shut down as well. Um, I mean, who knew in my lifetime that the biggest thing for a shutdown would be toilet paper that there would be a run on toilet paper and that you couldn't find it at the stores unless you got there early, early in the morning. Um, but other than that, I, I want to thank the citizens for working together as a city, uh, working together as human beings and helping out each other in this, in this time of need. It's really hard for all of us. Um, people are losing jobs. Uh, people are worried about what's going to happen in the future. Um, but I think if we stick together and we work hard, uh, we can all get through this. I know it's going to go on for a few more weeks. So yeah, I want to shout out to all the West Jordan citizens, even though they might not be on 
our city council call tonight, but know that we as a council want to do everything we can to help out. And thank you to those um, city workers that are keeping the city going in this time of need as well. So thank you. Thank you. As you uh, said, run on toilet paper. I was hoping that wasn't a pun and looked over for the mayor, but happily he wasn't on screen. So that, that just stinks. I'm sorry for bringing that up. <laughs> Council member Worthen. Um, thanks for the little joke there. We need to smile right now. So any comedy is nice to have. Um, just re really reiterating a lot what they're saying. Um, stay home, stay safe. I know you hear it all the time. It's extremely important. This is scary. I mean, in, in some you know circumstances, at, at some times, if we're watching too much of the news, it's terrifying. And like Chad said, who knew in our lifetime we would see something like this? Um, it is scary. It's terrifying. But the best thing we can do from each other is keep each other safe by keeping our social distance. I'm an extrovert. That's not the easiest thing in the world for me. Um, I do work from home typically, so I am used to that part, but it's a little harder not being able to sit next to you guys and see you and be able to go out with friends and visit with people. I especially want to give a major shout out to our kids from the little ones to the teenagers, but you know, those seniors that are graduating this year, God bless you. What a difficult time for you, but know that, you know, we're, a lot of us are thinking of you and you know, I'm sure we're going to have different ways that we're going to make this up to you as we get closer. Hopefully you will be able to get back into school before the end of the year. So you don't have to miss out on so much, but really, you know, God bless you guys. It's, we know it's tough on you. I mean, it's tough on us as adults, but especially as seniors in high school graduations, uh, personally, my son graduated with his master's and is not coming home to do his master's graduation. Um, but just graduating from high school, that's a huge accomplishment. Like I said, God bless you. You're amazing. Proud of you, every single one of the seniors. Keep strong and we'll get you there. Okay, next up, council member Pack. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you to everyone for the fabulous teamwork that's been going on. Uh, Chairman McConaughey, Vice Chair Green and David Bricky, Alan Anderson working with us, and then the mayor, his staff, the citizens. I've been able to keep social distancing, but also wanting to walk around on sidewalks and just say hello to people. And you know, people are are holed up a little bit as as we all should be. Um, but also, hopefully, we're looking out for each other. I'm grateful for the technology that we have that allows us to meet this way. It was mentioned with the earthquake. My personal experience was that within five minutes of it happening, I checked on my children at home, made sure they were okay. Grateful for schools doing drills because my son was underneath his bed and my daughter and I were getting in the door jam uh, to, you know, because the, the training has, uh, thankfully we had uh, grace under pressure there, <laughs> but also within five minutes, I was able to text my parents, able to text my extended family, cousins, uncles, was in communication with city council, mayor's staff, grateful for those communications. Everything from uh, PTSA organizations at schools to community councils to church and volunteer and neighbors. So it was probably five, maybe 10 minutes at the most able to be in contact with uh, everyone. So thankful that we have that, that opportunity to connect. Also with technology, thankful for the emails uh, that we've set up this opportunity to get emails directly from residents. And <clears throat> I received a couple of emails today, one from a gentleman who wanted to know who to contact at City Hall for various um, information. And so I'm assuming that the phone numbers and email addresses and everything is still, they're still going to be working. So I referred him to staff who is in charge of, of different areas, but, but hoping that even though they're working remotely, they'd have access to their phones. Uh, one resident also mentioned that out in, in District 4, she has an elderly mother um, who answered the door and there was a candidate running for office, someone that, that was representing the candidate wanting to get signatures. And she was concerned about you know, sharing pens and, and you know what steps should we take? And I said, I, I'm unsure of which 
candidate this would be, and some things are out of our purview, but I, I wanna bring up um, concerns where we are trying to keep the social distancing. And with, with that, as Mayor Burton uh, mentioned the soft closure, and I'm grateful Mayor Burton for your article in the West Jordan Journal. I read that every month. Thank you for authoring that. I just wanted to make sure that we balance prudence with liberty. What I mean by that is obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but to me and other residents that I've spoken with, it makes sense to close pavilions, to close playgrounds, these high traffic areas. But also there's been a concern about the more liberties that are taken away, the more antsy people get, and that could also cause an equal and opposite reaction that, that could be detrimental. So um, I know that many things are federally mandated by President Trump, and then we get county mandates from Mayor Wilson. Uh, we get state mandates from Governor Herbert, but the autonomy that we do retain in the city, I, I'd like to invite all of us, certainly myself included, to be mindful of making sure we don't just unilaterally make a decision that might close everything. For instance, certain activities might have different distancing. Uh, just from my experience being a tennis pro, let's say you can be 60 or 90 feet apart from, from someone, never even touch them, uh, never be too close. Uh, you're not touching any equipment, um, trails. Uh, let, let's just make sure that we recognize that in our desire to be prudent citizens and not spread any virus uh, that we still want to ensure that people feel that there's still opportunity and look at what they can do instead of just what they can't do. So instead of a unilateral rule, perhaps we could look at things uh, individually to make sure there's still opportunities for people to do prudent activities. So thank you, Chair. Council Member Jacob. There we go, had to unmute myself. Um, no, thank you. I wanna echo what pretty much everybody has said, uh, good comments all the way around. Um, I did want to mention that uh, I, I also want to encourage uh, our residents and citizens as much as possible to support the businesses that are open. And yeah, that's a little bit self-serving because I'm one of them, but, um, but for everybody who is still open and just trying to make ends meet, trying to stay afloat, um, Please, as, as much as you can, be safe and, and support those businesses. There's, I mean, the restaurants are doing the curbside delivery. Um, a lot of stores that you wouldn't think otherwise would be that kind of a store will also do curbside delivery. Um, they'll deliver things to your home and leave it on your porch and call you and say, it's there. Go outside, you'll see it. Um, the, a lot of uh, businesses are doing FaceTime and Skype to show you things in their showrooms and in their stores so that you can make sure you're getting what you think you're getting and just opening those opportunities up to um, utilize the technology that we have in place that allows us to meet like this and allows us to stay in contact with our friends and family to also use it to keep our local economy at least somewhat afloat. So I just want to encourage that. Um, again, stay safe, everybody. And and, uh, you know, be, be smart, but uh, be smart in, in, uh, in all the different ways. And, and oh, and props to our, our staff and, and uh, mayor's office and everybody else who's doing a great job keeping the city uh, limping along. Uh, we're more than limping along, keeping the city running along just fine uh, as this uh, craziness continues. Hopefully this is temporary and it won't be too long before we're back to normal-ish as normal as we get here in our city anyway that's all all right thank you council member jacob i don't have anything unique to add uh that hasn't already been shared so thank you for thank you for those comments next up uh since the council did approve uh citizen comments wanted to give just a few more moments should somebody wish to join us live, here's the information to do so off on the top right corner. It's also available on the city's website on the agenda. Um, like I said previously, ideal is to join by computer. There's your meeting number and there's the password. Uh, since this is being done electronically, it's gonna be pretty similar to what we typically have but uh, with a few minor modifications. Usually when you come and you attend in person, 
there's a paper printout uh, of the agenda. And it's got a little bit of notice on there. So we just wanted to highlight uh, some of the, the elements of that. If someone from the public does wish to speak tonight, this is going to be the only opportunity to do so. Uh, there's no other opportunity within the meeting for citizen comment. Uh, you can talk on anything you wish. It doesn't have to be on the agenda. It could be, it doesn't have to. It's really the floor is open to you to say what you'd like for up to three minutes. Uh, typically, this is where we'll just sit and listen. The council doesn't usually uh, engage or um, Occasionally, we'll get folks that ask us questions. We'll try and make sure that the citizen asking is directed to the right resource. But this is your time to be heard, not so much to ask us questions and then have us speak back to you. This is your time to be heard as a citizen. We do require in our council rules that citizens help us maintain the decorum of the meeting. So uh, this is one of the things that's a little bit different uh, than in person. In person, when you're there, you're in front of us face to face, and you can speak and you can share your thoughts. During the online meeting, uh, we would ask that you share your, your actual name, not just a screen name, but your, your real name and let us know if you're a resident of the city or what your interest in West Jordan is. Uh, we will not be accepting anonymous comments. Uh, we've seen what's happened with some of the other municipalities that they've attempted electronic meetings. And you'll also notice our forms a little bit different to combat some of the problems that they've run into while still giving us an opportunity to open up and let the public speak. Um, and then as always, this is, again, copy and paste from our regular rules, but the verbal attacks or against others or being disrespectful during the proceedings may, re may result in being dismissed from citizen comments. So that was quite a bit to say um, and wanted to really give opportunity for anyone who wanted to join us um, to see if there's anyone who would like to speak during citizen comments. I'm ready to open it up. And I'm looking at the attendees, the list of attendees that are in the uh, meeting right now in listen only mode. Again, if you're in there at the bottom of the screen, there should be a little option to hit a hand if you'd like to raise your hand and speak. And that'll be the cue to me that uh, you'd like your three minutes. I mentioned before that people can also join by phone. Um, I don't see that anybody has done so. And I'll give it just another few seconds to see if any hands go up. And it doesn't look like there's anybody from the public who has joined us who wishes to speak. So I will close citizen comments and we will move forward. Um, this is, like I said, it's a little bit different format this time. Uh, for some people, this may be easier than coming to speak in person. But uh, for those who still want to make sure your voice is heard, it was mentioned in some of the staff reports that in addition to participating during the regular electronic meeting, you also have the ability to send comments offline as well. So we have a phone number where anybody can call and leave a message 24 hours a day that gets sent to each member of the city council. And then we also have an email address, councilcomments at westjordan.utah.gov where you can type your comment and submit it there. And that will also come to each council, to every single council member. If you go to the website, to the city's website, you can look under the government section and you can see the individual council members. And it does give you an option to send something to council, uh, to the mayor or members of the council individually. But we've added these options to be sure that um, we're giving every opportunity for the public to have their voice heard. So um, please be aware of that. You'll see that on the website too. And we will move on from citizen comments now to our consent items. We only have one item uh, for consent today. And uh, I would entertain a motion or discussion. I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Motion by Council Member Jacob, second by Council Member Whitelock. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, let's vote. Mr. Anderson. Yes, uh, Council Member Pack. Yes. Council Member Green. Yes. Council Member Jacob. Yes. Council Member Lamb. Yes. Council Chair McConaughey. Aye. Council Member Worthen. Yes. Council Member Whitelock. Yes. Motion passes 7 0. All right. That means we do not need to discuss items that were pulled by the City Council. 
And we move on to our first business item, business item A, uh, which is listed as appointing David Bricky as council office director and legal advisor to the city council. Um, council member Green, did you want to start on this one? Do I want to start on this one? Uh, it, this one wasn't the one that there was an issue. Do we need to consider them both together or do we want to separate them out? I guess that would be my question. I mean, they're already separated. Do, do I want to, I, I guess... Kayleen has her hand. Council member Whitelock. I just have a question. Um, due to the fact that we just saw the contract yesterday and we haven't had, I have not had time to get all of my questions answered, nor am I okay with it. I'm not sure that I want to do A before we do B. I'm just not comfortable doing it at this point. Um, I want to be able to vote yes to um, have David work for us, but I can't say yes to that when I can't say yes to the contract. So I'd rather we have some dialogue before we do it. All right, so. So with that particular, with, with that feedback, uh, I am going to make a motion that due to the modifications that still need to occur, I move to postpone this agenda item until April 8th. I'll second it. We have a motion by Council Member Green, second by Council Member Whitelock. Discussion to the motion. Uh, my only question would be, can we set a time to discuss what we need to discuss before the 8th? So can we put that into the motion of saying we're going to discuss it on a certain date or do we want to? If we did that, we have to set a meeting because we, unless we decide that we do this in small groups. I'm fine setting a meeting. I mean, I don't know where the rest of you are at. It's been difficult, I understand, because we haven't been able to talk as a group, but now we can through this format, so. Any additional discussion to the motion? Council Member Pack, are you trying to speak? Sorry. Thank you. May I ask what implications there might be in postponing this yet further? I'm wondering if we miss any deadlines. Um, if there's any, you know, with every action, there's an equal opposite reaction, pros and cons. Uh, certainly we want to make sure we have ample discussion, but is there anything that we might not be considering if we could ask Mr. Mr. Wall or uh, Ricky? Would that be a question for Mr. Wall? I see his camera has just come on. Uh, Chair McConaughey, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to respond to that. Uh, as we discussed uh, a number of weeks ago, um, based upon the terms of the current employment contract, which as you recall was amended in December, uh, if the council uh, there's four, five or four contingencies that if one of these uh, occurs, um, then uh, Mr. Bricky's employment ends and he's paid the severance payment per his original contract and he's no longer an employee of the city. And one of those is that the council needs to renew the contract or approve a successor agreement uh, prior to midnight on April 6th. So if you put this on until the 8th, then as of midnight, April 6th, uh, Mr. Bricky is no longer employed by the city and his severance kicks in. 
but aren't but aren't we paying the severance anyway not no in full. necessarily um that was just my question because uh, it kind of kicks back in an effort to ensure we get the contract right it actually means that other contract provisions kick in and so it's kind of a catch-22 now you do have you do have an option and that is the current agreement by its terms you remember again his original contract you amended that december 20th and one of the provisions you put in there on the 20th was that the council is authorized to extend this current contract so you could vote to extend this current contract for another month or whatever you see is necessary uh, to be able to have some more time to discuss what the terms of an ongoing employment agreement would be. <laughs> Everybody up. All right. Um, the question came from Mr. Pack to Mr. Wall. So I'll, we'll let Mr. Pack finish up with uh, any follow-up questions. Then we'll go to Kelvin. And I also noticed that uh, Mr. Bricky had his hand raised on here as well, too. So, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess, again, that kind of kicks back that if we renew it, I know I, if I'm assuming correctly for residents and for council members, part of the issue in wanting to have additional time to review the contract is the compensation. And if there's a concern about the compensation, extending his contract another month would increase compensation in, in one of the areas. So notice on um, business item A here, we're talking about council office director and a legal advisor. So if, if we're worried a bit about money, in a way we, we're talking about a two for one here, if we're hiring someone, for, for instance, we'd have to pay a legal advisor a lot more if we didn't have Mr. Bricky being a council office director and legal advisor. Um, we. You know, and we've done many interviews, much deliberation late into the night. And so I believe we're comfortable with appointing him, if I'm not mistaken. And understandably, there, you know, we want everyone to have a chance to voice concern and opinion on a contract. But again, by deferring that, there might actually create more issue and, and more pay as we see that this severance could get kicked in and, and um, extending a contract at a higher pay level instead of what we are currently considering in rolling two into one, council office director at a lower pay rate than a city manager pay rate, and then a legal advisor at a lower compensation than if we had to hire a separate legal counsel. Thank you. All right, next to speak to the motion was council member Green. First, I'll be willing to amend my motion to a date earlier if we need to, if we're amenable to setting a meeting. But I think the soonest we could do that, given notice requirements, is probably Monday. Uh, so I, I'm amenable to amend that. Uh, I don't think that we can amend the contract tonight because it's not been uh, noticed on the agenda, if, I, if I'm correct. So. Uh, I don't think we can, I don't think we can amend the, the current contract. Uh, so I think we, I think we need to uh, move forward. I mean, I, I guess I, I mean, we, we, the contract does end on April 6th. So we've got, and Monday, April 6th is the, the soonest we could meet given notice requirements. So if we can, for lack of a better term, assemble, I was going to say throw together, if we can assemble a quick meeting just to address these two agenda items on Monday sometime, I'm amenable to that. I actually made the eighth just because I knew we needed a discussion period and a motion to postpone requires a date. And then next was council member Whitelock followed by council member Worthen. Council member Whitelock, you are not coming through. Can you hear me now? There you are. Okay. Um, 
you mentioned just money. There is more in this contract that I have concerns with. One of them is 4.3a. Another one is 8.1c. So it is not just the financial part that I have concerns with. And as far as um, worrying about the financial part, I think that is a concern. I've heard that concern from community members, but we need to make sure that we get this contract right. For me, it needs to be right. And as I read the contract, it looked like severance was in there. So to me, it looks like we pay a severance either way because he lost his job as city manager. That's what I understand the severance is for. So I think he's getting that either way. So I'm not sure. Um, I just hope that we're all thinking about the whole contract and every word it says, not just the compensation. Because for me, it's everything it says. Thanks. And Council Member Worthen. Um, I would put out, a so I want to make a motion that we extend the contract to April 15th because we do have a meeting on the 8th and we can put it into a work session or however we need to put it in. But that would give us that time to talk about it and still a few more days in between. So my motion is to extend the contract to April 15th with a discussion on the 8th. So, so is this a substitute motion? Yes. Can I do that, Calvin? Is that okay with you? Oh, you muted yourself. We need to defer to, uh, we need to ask the city attorney if we can extend the, the contract because it's not on the, it's not on the agenda. And typically in a city council meeting, we cannot vote and make a decision unless it's been on the agenda. Is that correct? Uh, yes, council member, that's correct. The, the way that the item was advertised was to adopt a specific res resolution and a specific, uh, contract and in fact the contract was posted as part of the uh, notice so you would need to uh, as I think you council member well maybe not suggested that there could be a very quick meeting held between now and the sixth where we could prepare a very brief it would probably be no more than two pages it could be one if we didn't have to have the stance and formalities of government documents on it uh, anyway, a short agreement that extends the current employment agreement for two weeks, three weeks, whatever you'd like uh, to give you time to consider the long-term agreement. Okay. All right, so procedurally, was that a substitute motion or not a substitute motion? We still have the original on the, on the table. I think based on that advice, we probably have the original motion on the table. I mean, I could amend it to the 15th um, and then we could, so I'm talking out loud as part of the debate for this. I could amend the motion and move the contract to the, the discussions to the 15th instead of the 8th. Um, if, and then we would have to make a separate motion to have a separate meeting uh sometime between now and the sixth and it would have to and it would have to meet the public notice requirements and given those requirements we it either has to be posted tomorrow at noon for friday or for monday so we don't have a whole lot of options but we can do that i am interested in hearing some suggestions I'm fine with what Calvin is suggesting, and we just need to pick a time between Monday and Friday that we can have a discussion. I'd rather do it sooner than later. And I'm happy to meet as well um, with our technology. We could even perhaps do something in the day, lunchtime, um, nights are taken. Um, I want to be flexible and, uh, and amenable to being available. Council Member Jacob. Thank you. Um, a couple of thoughts here um one is is there anybody else besides council member whitelock who has questions or concerns that wants to hammer this out further i see a raised hand and okay two raised hands um 
just because I think if there's, you know, concerns with the contract that that one council member doesn't feel comfortable with, I don't think is a reason to hold it up and to schedule an extra meeting, yada, yada, yada. Um, that's number one. Number two, I'd like to hear from Mr. Bricky. I think you mentioned that he had raised his hand or uh, asked to speak a few minutes ago. We haven't heard from him. So I'd like to hear from him how he'd like to proceed uh, before proceeding. He had put his hand up, but uh, Rob Wall had answered the question, so he pulled his hand down. But uh, wow. given the invitation you threw out there, we'll... uh, Mr. Bricky, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I was just concerned that everybody understood the effect of what happened on uh, the 6th of April. That was my concern, was that making sure that all seven of you knew what was coming as a result of that uh, prior contract's expectation of things being concluded then. I'm certainly willing to sit and talk to every uh, one of you. I haven't changed my style of keeping things informed. Um, I am a little different position. This is not a position with the city. I do not work for the mayor. I do not work for Corbin Lee. I work for you seven. And that's a unique reality that the public doesn't appreciate at the present time because you do have a new form of government for the first time in the last three months. I work for you seven. Um, so to be clear about that, um, you're also getting as pointed out by council members that you're getting an advisor who's familiar with the city and an attorney. So if you need time uh, to talk tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, I'm around all four days. Uh, let's get this done by Monday. Council Member Green. The main reason for the motion is, is that I don't want to uh, try and go through the contract and make amendments, um, for lack of a better term, from the dais on the fly. I, I want to I want to give everybody a chance for another day or two to 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 look at this and and make sure that we get the wording. Um, I agree with uh, Council Member Anderson. Uh, there are a couple of sections uh, that that. I mean, why, I'm looking at Kayleen Anderson on yeah, her just, screen. Sorry, Whitelock. Uh, <laughs> Kayleen, you have one of those. <laughs> you're screwing me up. I'm I'm reading your name off of the screen, not uh, not thinking who I'm talking about. But I agree with Council Member Whitelock uh, that there are a couple of paragraphs that I think need to be modified, and I don't want to I don't want to try to do that on the fly, making those amendments uh, sitting here. So. That's why I made the motion is so that we can uh, take another day or two and get the uh, the contract right, you know, take another, yeah, take another day or two to get the contract right, post the right public notice so that we can do this right. So we do have a motion on the table, but from the conversation to the motion, it sounds like there's likely a change to that. Do you want to rescind the original motion and put forward a new motion i will withdraw the previous motion and make a motion that we uh postpone this agenda item until april 15th that'll be the first motion uh and and then i'll make a second one we have a motion to postpone this till, uh, sorry, did you say postpone or table or? Postpone. Okay, so postpone till April 15th. Do we have a second? I'll second. S motion by Council Member Green, second by Council Member Lamb. Any discussion to the motion? Chair McConaughey. I was going to say, Brickey. before Rob talks, uh, so one of my worries as we do that, so with Ricky's contract ending on the 6th, does that mean from the 6th to the 15th, Ricky doesn't work because he doesn't have a contract? So uh, I'll jump in real quick. It, because these are two different items, this first one is appointing him as the council office director and legal advisor. Mm -hmm. And that one's something that I believe can be delayed until the 15th. It's the second item, uh, business item B, that deals with his contract. And there's going to have to be a separate one for that. And that's going to have to be dealt with prior to the honor prior to the 6th. Okay. Is that accurate, uh, Councilmember Green? 
Well, what I'm thinking is we postpone this contract until the 15th, and then I would make a motion that we have a, and so I, I haven't made that yet, but I would make a motion that we meet on April 6th for the purposes of extending the contract so we can provide notice, then we can hold that meeting, vote, extend the contract out through April 15th, and then uh, vote on the contract on it. That's my, that's my thought behind this process is postpone this, postpone um, the two items that are the, on the business items, uh, five um, A and B, postpone those, and then hold a meeting that we can properly notice to extend the contract on, on, it, on April 6th. But I don't want to make the compound motion, so that's why I made the the one to April fifteenth first. Okay. Thank you, Council Member Green. Uh, Mr. Wall. Thank you, Chair McConaughey. One thing the council may want to consider is if if you're confident that the motion to meet again on the sixth will be approved, that's fine. But you may want to approve that motion first because if you postpone the matter till the fifteenth, and then the motion to meet on the sixth fails you will have the contract terminated on the 6th and Mr. Bricky will no longer be an employee. So my suggestion is you move to meet on the 6th first. If that passes, then make the second motion to the 15th, which is fine. Okay, so that's that's some good advice. So I'm going to withdraw that motion. A Alan, you're going to have fun with the minutes, aren't you? I'm going to withdraw that motion and I will make a, a motion that we hold a meeting on April 6th for the purposes of extending uh, the contract of David Bricky until we can make the, until we can properly hear the contract. And a subsequent contract. Subsequent contract, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'll second that. Motion by council member Green, second by council member Worthen. Any discussion to this motion? Um, yes, if I may. All right. Was that uh, Council Member Jacob? Were you raising your hand there? Yeah, I was. Okay. You're, I, you're right hand a little not... off screen, so I'm kind of watching the shoulder. So, Council Member Jacob will start with you, then we'll go to Council Member Pack. Thank you. Um, unsurprisingly, I, I'm i ready to move forward tonight, so I'll be opposed to the, the tabling of this. Um, I really think that if individual Council Members have issues with the contract, they can address those offline and maybe should have by now. Um, I'm I'm fine moving forward tonight, so I'll just be opposed to this. Thanks, Council Member Pack. Thank you. Curious if we should set a time if we're just saying right now that we're going to do it on the six, so that we don't scramble or forget about that. Would it be prudent to set a time right now so that we know that we all can meet and coordinate seven, eight, nine people schedules at the same time? Personally, I would rather not set a time as part of the motion. I think calendaring within a motion can be very, very difficult, but that that's just me. Um, okay, move on. And, uh, the last part of that is speaking to, I, I always want to ensure that I have all the information possible. And so I agree with council member Jacob that I would be comfortable moving forward, but also I wanna recognize that if there are concerns that other people have, I might not have considered those concerns. So to, even though I would be comfortable moving forward right now, I want to ensure that we all talk together, that everybody is heard. And I'm sure I could learn something new from a different point of view. So I'll, uh, I, I'd be in favor of, of it, although I would also, uh, I was also ready to move forward with uh, the resolution tonight, hey, Andy. Thank you. Council member, Council member Whitelock. I just need to put it on record that I did try to reach out and get these concerns resolved before this meeting, but that was not possible. So I did try and I have concerns, but you may vote on this contract, but my vote will be no. Okay. Any other discussion to the motion? All right, seeing none, let's vote. Oh wait, timeout. Council member Worthen, did you have something to say? 
Um, the only thing I was going to say, and I hate to say it, maybe amend the emotion, the, the emotion, not the emotion, um, to just say honor before the sixth. That way it flexes up some time if we need to meet before the sixth, if someone can't do the sixth for some reason, just to address David's concerns. I can amend the motion to, to say honor before the sixth. And who did the second on that one come from? Me. Council member Lamb did. Oh no, I did that one. Oh, he did the other one. one. Did your second stand? Yep. Okay. Any conversation to the freshly amended motion? <laughs> All right, seeing none, I think we can finally vote. Council member Anderson, or sorry, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, and uh, I've been f fastidiously typing. <laughs> um, Council Member Whitelock. Yes. Council Chair McConaughey. Aye. Council Member Lamb. No. Council Member Worthen. Yes. Council Member Jacob. No. Council Member Green. Yes. Council member Pack. Yes. Was that a yes? Yes. Motion passes five to two. All right. So with that being said, now I'm going to move to postpone uh, business items 7A and 7B to April 15th. I'll second. Motion by Council Member Green, second by Council Member Whitelock. Discussion to the motion. All right, was that, did I see a hand, Council Member Jacob? Was that just a flicker? All right, uh, not seeing any conversation, we will move to a vote. Mr. Anderson. Thank you. That one was less typing. <laughs> um, Council Member Lamb. No. Council Member Pack. Yes. Council Member Worthen. Yes. Council Member Green. Yes. Council Chair McConaughey. Aye. Council Member Whitelock. Yes. Council Member Jacob. No. Motion passes five to two. All right. So that brings us through uh, business item A and business item B, which means we are now on C, which is uh, the West Jordan City Emergency Response Plan. And we're gonna be hearing from our risk manager, Jared Smith. And I am changing his role back to panelist right now. So he'll see a little bit of a blip and then he'll be re-added as a panelist. And there we go. You'll just need to unmute yourself. So you're still muted. Okay, thank you, Council. Can you hear there me? There you go. Yep, you're good. Proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I, first of all, just wanted to invite you. I it created a Teams, a Microsoft Teams account and put the emergency operations plan on that um, drive. Um, Alan told me today that Council Member Whitelock wasn't able to get um, have access to the T drive, which would be would have been a common file. The problem with the emergency operations plan is that it's a it's a big bulky document. It's not very easily shared um, through email, and so um, we had to put it on a common drive. I put it on the on the Teams drive with a few other documents that you might that you might find of interest. But I'll just go through real quick to make sure that you have an understanding of what the, the city's purpose and emergency operations is and what our directive and mandate is from the federal government. Um, the first thing that I wanted to, to bring up was that there's the, where our mandate comes from with the uh, federal government, the National Incident Management System, or otherwise called, uh, known to refer to as NIMS, is a system that 
requires all cities and all states, all municipalities across the country to be able to um, coordinate, communicate effectively and um, seamlessly with one another. So that in Oklahoma, they're speaking the same language and, and adopting the same practices that we are in Utah. If, if um, you know, the state of Oklahoma were to step in and help out municipalities in Utah or vice versa. So all over the country, the mandate from the federal government is that we would adopt the, the NIMS, the National Institute of Management System, and it helps to, um, it, it does a few things. First of all, it, it clearly defines with unity of, or, or the, um, the central command in a, in a disaster emergency response is. And the first item to, that we need to be aware of when we're talking about um, command and control in the disaster is that the federal government expects that the local governments are, are um, the first line of defense, the first um, operating, the first incident management of any, of any incident, uh, no matter what the incident is. And so the federal government has pushed back down onto, and, and I think appropriately so, pushed back down onto the governments, the local governments, to be prepared. So what that requires is that every employee, the city, we've got to be prepared so that in any disaster, we're able to respond. Now, the National Institute of Management System um, identifies and prioritizes the, the set of orders, so it um, universalizes what the priorities are for municipalities in, a, in responding to an incident. The first one is life safety, the second one is instant stabilization, and the third one is property preservation, in, in that order. Um, and it, it requires that we adopt what it's called the Incident Command System Principles, or ICS Principles. Uh, Incident Command is like a set of Lego blocks where we can add um, pieces as we need to. As the incident grows and expands, we're able to add pieces and support uh, those pieces on top. And so um, as the incident grows, we can expand it. And uh, all across the country, they practice the same uh, model in, in Incident Command. And it's also required that we we adopt the NIMS, um, the NIMS system and the NIMS principles of the city if we're ever going to seek reimbursement for damage assistance in a, in a disaster. Um, so if we're not NIMS compliant, then the, the federal government can come in and say, we're, we can't assist you because you haven't adopted the appropriate principles. Um, and also the, the, the plan, and this is where the emergency operation plan is a really big bulky document because of all of these things. Um, because it has to be um, applied to every kind of disaster that the city can have, it's a big umbrella, it's an overarching document that, it, that encompasses um, any kind of disaster, all hazards from natural disaster, man-made disaster to terrorist events. Um, it really takes into account all the disasters that we could have in a city that could stress the resources of the city. So the emergency operations plan, is a, it's a big 500-page document. I, I don't like this document, other than that we have to have it to be compliant with the National Incident Management System. So it checks all the boxes that we have to have in adopting a, an emergency operations plan. Unfortunately, it's not a very detailed document and, and um, what are the city's response is gonna be in any given incident. So um, when people, employees will say, well, what's our plan for responding to an earthquake? Well, you go to the emergency operations plan and it gives just a general overview of what the city's response is going to be in an earthquake and how we're going to identify uh, resources and, and identify, identify assistance for resources in any given incident. Um, so as you scroll through and you read through the emergency operations plan, you'll, you'll find that there's not very many detailed, specific, um, actionable items that the city can take other than to be compliant with the rest of the city. So these are the things that we train on as a city so that we can coordinate and communicate with, um, well, first of all, our, our next line of support for the city is the county. So we have to seamlessly be able to operate with the county from the county to the state, from the state to the federal government. Um, so that's what the National Incident Management System is. And that's really what, how the Emergency Operations Plan is built. It's built to be NIMS compliant. And there's just not an easy way to do that and have it in a concise, um, exact, precise document that's really operational. Um, but but what, the, what, the, what NIMS does, what the National Incident Management System does is, is it separates the responsibilities of the city. And the first one is the policy group. So the policy group is typically made up of department heads, the mayor, the CAO, and the legislative body um, as kind of an ancillary or secular, depending on the form of government, is gonna be a piece of the policy group. Underneath the policy group, there's 
um, it kind of branches off into separate separate um, orders, but the, the the a big piece of it is the public information, or what um, we refer to as the Joint Information Center or the JIC, is um, where all communication flows is, is meant to flow in and out, and so it's a unified communication piece that that um, sits kind of underneath the policy group. And next to the policy, the Joint Information Center is the Emergency Operations Center, which is where uh, we operate. Um, the role of the Emergency Operations Center is to gather information. We provide situational awareness. Uh, we, we use all the operating groups for the city, which is going to be public works. Um, police and fire are the main operations groups. They're going to get together. We need to, we're going to coordinate and get so that we can get situational awareness on whatever the incident is. If it's an active shooter, the police department is going to be the main operating group, and all the rest of us are going to be supporting the operations group on the, on the, on the field in the incident commander. Um, so, so, so NAMS is, is really this big overarching um, system for managing incidents. So I, and the FEMA has created a couple, um, specifically they've created one training for elected officials. It's, um, a, for, it's a course that elected officials can take. I downloaded the PDF um, PowerPoint slides and I put them all onto the team's under the files there, so you can view those and go through those. Again, it's it's a it's a big broad umbrella, and so it's not going to be very precise. As if you wanted to say, well, what is my role in any given disaster? It's not going to be very descriptive in that, but it's going to give these overarching principles that we can that we're going to operate under. The third document that I put under the team's um, guide, which is from the state of Utah, under the the kind of the business side of of Utah, the Be Ready Utah. They really created a really good document um, that's there, that's the Public Officials Guide to Disasters. And so if you guys wanted to take some time to look at that, look at that document, that's a pretty good document that um, kind of outlines and, and kind of gives some checklist as to what a public official's role would be in a disaster. And essentially, um, so, so police officers or public works folks, the streets folks, they might have a question and say, well, in an earthquake, what's my role in an earthquake? And the simple response is, well, your role is to be what you do every day, is to maintain operations. The city's goal is to always maintain operations in any disaster. So um, it's, and it's not that much different for city council. City council is still going to be, um, is still going to legislate and create policy. Uh, if that's what their, their role is under the form of government, they're going to uh, maybe set budgets or, or um, give allowances for budgets if that's what their role is. And so this Be Ready document is a pretty good guide for what city council, what your role is. But essentially, the role isn't that much different in a, in a disaster for city council. What it, what it requires of us as staff of the city is to really coordinate and um, coordinate the communication between all the different groups, between what's happening out in the field, what's, what's uh, the support group doing in the emergency operations center, what information is coming in uh, from outside sources or from residents, and then um, Sending that all to the policy groups, so that the policy group can really make the policy. Um, the, the emergency operations doesn't take over any of the policy making. It doesn't take over the operations in the field. The emergency operations center is really just to support and to gather and bring in so support and resources for an incident that overwhelms the department. So, in an active shooter, um, you know, if there was, um, this is, I don't like doing this, but it's a morbid, it's a morbid case to, to talk about an active shooter. But if there were, um, you know, other resources that we could bring in as far as assisting and, and documenting items or put, uh, opening up shelters or opening up, um, you know, reunification centers, then that's what EOCs will typically do in those types of situations. But basically, it's to support the police department and their operations. But we wouldn't come in, the emergency operations center doesn't come in and make and tell the, op, and tell the uh, on-field operations group what they need to do or how they need to handle the response. Um, it's really meant to seamlessly coordinate all these pieces and to communicate, and that's where we practice and exercise is, is really that coordination and that communication between all those different groups. Um, the, the, the last part that I um, really wanted to, to, to provide or some, some insight or some direction for city council on what their role is and what your role is in a disaster is, um, you know, we're looking at two things in a disaster. And the main thing is to ensure the continuity of government for the city. And we do that 
by maintaining the ability um, to uh, the city council to continue operate as a legislative body for the city, which is interesting that that's what you guys are doing tonight um, by by you know not meeting as as we normally do, but continuing that that meeting and not canceling these meetings is exactly what we should be doing in the disaster. Um, and our council staff should address logistical issues associated with maintaining council operations. Um, if there's alternative sites or alternative uh, methods for communicating to residents, the, those things that have to be communicated, then that's what um, we're looking for the city council to continue. The bigger, the bigger piece in any disaster that we often don't think about um, when we talk about disasters, and um, which is really the biggest piece of a disaster, is recovery. And if um, if you if you look at recovery, I mean, uh, Hurricane Sandy, they're still recovering from Hurricane Sandy. They're still not uh, put all the way back together. There's still operations going on there. There's still really big policy and legislative decisions that have to be made with Hurricane Sandy. And so um, this post-disaster recovery and the emergency operations as it transfer, as it um, you know mutates from emergency operations and, and a response into a recovery operations can take months. Uh, and even years to effectively, you know, put the put the community back uh, to whole, and that's where the city council would have the biggest um, assist and, and probably the biggest work is, you know, looking at zoning, um, you know, zoning issues or planning issues, uh, making sure that um, you know we have the the laws and, and the right codes in place so that we can assist and aid recovery as best as we can. One of the things that I thought about this week as um, I was out in the community. Um, uh, I drove by Chick-fil-A and I noticed that Chick-fil-A had these two big freezers out in front of their business. And I'm not sure what those freezers are for, but they had them parked right in the parking lot, you know, where normally the handicapped parking would go. And so it made me think, you know, are, is there some violation of a code? And I hope that we could be flexible in our code so that we don't, so that we're aiding in the recovery and not hindering our businesses in recovery. And so looking at and taking a global approach at looking at the, the recovery is where um, our, our biggest effort is going to be, uh, and this pandemic is going to stretch all of our resources to get everyone back and try to build the community back as well as we can. And so as we transition from the emergency operations into a recovery operation, um, having the city council's input and, and, and guidance is going to be um, monumental. So um, with that, I, I, I mean, I would just direct you, I wasn't prepared to go through the whole uh, 402 course um, for, from from the, from FEMA. I'd be happy to do that sometime if that's uh, if you feel like it would be beneficial. If um, the city council wanted to have more um, direction and more training on what on how what the NIMS is on, on what the National Incident Management System is, what the federal government mandate is, uh, what the incident command system is, and how we utilize that in the city, I'd be more than happy to come and do that. Uh, run through an exercise, even though. We've had two real world events here that, um, that have tested us and I'm grateful for the opportunity to walk through these exercises that, that are, the disaster isn't worse than what it is that we're able to kind of um, learn as we go. And there's certainly a lot of things that we're um, doing that we could be doing better, we're not perfect. But uh, I can tell you that under the leadership that we have and with um, the city manager that we have, the CAO that we have, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any other CAO in the state that's as um, dedicated or as knowledgeable about emergency management than Corbin. And so he's had a lot of, under his leadership, we're able to move and think, it seems like 10 steps ahead of where we need to be. And um, so, so that's that's kind of the, the emergency management overview and uh, uh, 10 or, or uh, 30,000 foot overview of emergency management. Is there any questions that I can answer? Um, any further direction you'd like me to take? Council Member Jacob. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was actually having a conversation with the mayor the other day about a different topic, and this kind of came up. And I think as a council, one thing we might want to look at is a, uh, a set of code or a set of procedures or something that, that automatically kind of goes into play. You can't see my hand gestures. So I'm doing this. this is weird. Um, that goes into effect automatically when the mayor declares a state of emergency that does things like suspends, like you were talking about the, the freezers in the parking lot. Um, just some common sense steps that could just go into effect automatically 
uh, code wise or code enforcement wise, maybe, um, you know, other cities have taken steps with the sign ordinances in their cities to allow businesses to more um, actively promote that they were still open during, uh, you know, during a time when a lot of businesses are closed. So that the restaurants and the, um, the, the stores that are still open can put a sign out that says, we're still open, you know, um, suspending some of those rules or some of those ordinances that we have in the case of an emergency like this <clears throat> or some other emergency. Um, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but that's something that the mayor and I had just a brief conversation about, and he seemed to think that was kind of a neat idea to <clears throat> to maybe think about and, and start considering. Um, rather than trying to tackle things one at a time, you know, um, like should we suspend collecting utility fees for 15 days uh, during a 15 day state of emergency or not necessarily collecting, but maybe, um, maybe agreeing that we're not going to shut off water if the utility bill is not paid during an emergency. Um, things like that, it's just common sense things that we can, we can all kind of agree on to say, look, this stuff goes into effect when the mayor declares a state of emergency unless otherwise, <coughs> unless otherwise, uh, I don't know, acted upon by the council. I don't know quite what the right, right wording is there, but um, just something to think about, just some, some ideas to think about so that we don't have to come together as a council. I mean, you can see it took us three weeks, right? Um, we postponed the meeting. We took, it took us a long time to finally get together to meet. Um, it may take a long time for a council to get together to meet, to decide on what policies they may want to implement as a result of a state of emergency. So if we can come together on something like that, a plan like that in advance, um, of an emergency now, obviously not in advance of this emergency, but um, I think that would be something that's worth looking at. I know we all have uh, a lot on our plate and things, but just something for everybody to start thinking about. And uh, I'm not directing staff or anything. If the mayor wants to jump on that and direct you guys to come up with something to propose to the council, that would be great too. Uh, that's obviously up to him, but um, just throwing that out there is kind of a thought that I have had as we've um, you know, been dealing with the last few weeks. Council Member Pack. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Great presentation. I agree. That's what I was uh, thinking of this whole, these weeks that we have heard from federal and county and state governments that I, I believe it's pretty impossible to guard against every contingency of every subtle nuance of what might happen. But I agree that would be nice to be able to ascertain what's currently happening, what we're seeing real time right now, so that if something like this happens again in the future, it's just one act that we enact as opposed to trying to piecemeal it. And that way we could be more proactive as opposed to being reactive in an occurrence like this. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? General rule of thumb when on the web meeting, count to about seven to make sure everyone has an opportunity to take themselves off mute. I got to seven, I didn't see anything. So uh, thank you, Mr. Smith, I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. So that concludes our business items. Uh, does anybody have anything to share tonight for remarks? One thing I would share on top of everything else is a, a quick thank you to the mayor for uh, sharing a, an email about one of my favorite local establishments that was still open. He wanted to make sure I could still uh, get my meals from there and I just knew I had to do it online. So thank you for uh, staff for keeping us up on top of what we can do to help local businesses as well as res residents with everything going on. Okay, so if there are no more remarks, then we will go over to our work session, which is a budget workshop tonight uh, featuring our own Miss Denise Deck, uh, Director of Finance. So let me switch this over to make her a, hold on two seconds here. Oh, never mind. Let me switch this over to her and promote her as panelist.
All right, Denise, you should be able to. Let's see, let's check. Looks like you're muted. How's that? Much better. <laughs> Good. By the way, very important to say muted and not muted. In, in other <laughs> words, that all of a sudden you don't matter. Muted. Yeah. Muted. Subtle, but very important. All right. Um, so the host disabled participant screen sharing. So Councilman McConaughey, you want to fix that? You're not a you're not a participant participant anymore. You've been promoted to panelist. So it still tells me the same thing. Is it Chris? Do you need to stop sharing your screen first before? Oh, yeah. Uh huh. That 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 would do it. <laughs> Good job, Councilman Jacob. It's not my first webinar. <laughs> <laughs> it still says I'm disabled, though. We won't hold that against you. Americans with Disabilities oh, Act, I think, yeah. very much comes into play here. That's interesting. When we did our dry run, it worked. Council Chair McConaughey. Oh, it's um, up again. I've promoted her to co-host. Cool. Ah, Everyone see that go. screen? Yep. All right. Just like when we've met with you individually, if my screen stops going forward, let me know. So, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a current, do you see a screen that says current year budget update? Okay. Yes. Yep. So the current year budget update, um, we need to kind of let you know over the last 20 days, a lot has changed as have our estimates for the current year and uh, what we believe will happen by the end of this year. Then we're gonna move that forward into uh, discussing some of next year. So first of all, when things changed um, here with the economy and with COVID, um, it was a quick reminder of what we lived through in 2008. Well, a little bit different. It's very similar in the reaction that is happening to the economy. So I went back and, and recreated some sales tax history for West Jordan and realized that was, there was quite a bit of growth there in 2004 to 2008. And then the last quarter, exactly the same time of year in 2008, fiscal year 2008, so March 2008, was when we started seeing some decline in the economy. So 2008 likely would have been a bit higher than it was. 2008 hit, there was a slight bump in the economy, and then by the beginning of fiscal year 2009, which is July of 2008, uh, we started to see the drop in, in, in sales tax revenues. Continued to see a drop through 2009 and through 2010, which is through June of 2010, before we started seeing some recovery. This is really similar to other cities that I was serving in at the same time um, and in doing history for other cities. So in essence, when we have a severe drop off, it takes quite a while for a city to recover to the same place that it was previously. In West Jordan, it took about seven years. This is kind of what the percentage change from year to year was. And you can see during that time period or during that economic change, that it's more of a U shape, it's not quite a V shape. Um, we're listening to economists right now and um, I've been consulting with the state, consulting with other cities, consulting with the county, and we believe that it's going to be a similar kind of shape, more of a U than quite a V. We would wish for a V because it would really sharpen that incline, um, but we believe mm -hmm. that it will likely be more of a U shaped recovery. So pushing that forward, <laughs> Oh, you think it'll be a V? It's okay. Yeah, sorry, I thought I was muted. I thought I was talking to myself. Um, no, I'm. I'm. A, yeah. No, I just. You're a V guy, is, huh? Since this is a uh, workshop, I won't feel too bad about just yeah. interrupting. But, but no, I just think this. Uh, and I think it's apples and oranges from 2008 to 2000 um, to now to this thing because 2008 was a market correction that had a lot of external factors playing into it. It wasn't the government saying, "Hey, thou shalt not conduct business." for X amount of weeks, it was it was a natural kind of a correction in a lot of things that had led up to that point, policy decisions and, and, and market forces and things that had led to that growth that also led to the bubble that burst in 2008. It led to a sharp decline that required a long time to recover because it was a structural deficiency in the economy. And I'm not an economist, I'm just Joe Blow. 
city councilman. Um, <laughs> but I, this, this I think will be very different because I think once it, well, it depends on how this all plays out, but I think once restrictions are lifted and, and people are allowed to go back to normal, I think normalcy will resume relatively quickly. Um, I don't think that it's going to be a long, now it's easy for me to say, right? I still have a job. I still am, am doing all right. But, um, but that's, that's just my, my layman's perspective on this. It's just, a, it's a different animal. It's, it really is apples and oranges. Agreed. It is a very different animal in that. Um, when we, when I prepared this, um, I was thinking in that same mo mode. However, the economic, um, impact is going to be more severe than 2008, which is what all the economists are saying. Um, however, it may be short term, that is true, but the rise then will still start from where it fell off to. So you won't immediately go back up into what you expected before. You'll see that slow rise that you pretty much saw in 2008 in that um, there are some people that will, this will affect for a longer term because they're behind on mortgages or bills or those kinds of things. Right. And, and also some emotional spending, right? I mean, you tend to go, oh, gosh, I don't want to spend right now because who knows what's going to happen next. Um, so while these are, um, I wasn't as aggressive as a lot of cities are being, um, and I wasn't as quite as aggressive as the state's being in bringing it down, but I did continue a second year of reduction. Um, and the only reason we aren't seeing quite a bit of more of reduction in sales tax revenue is that thankfully we have that fourth quarter of a quarter sales tax, which actually brought this year up a little bit. Um, so we won't see quite the decrease from 19 that we would have seen had we not had that additional million and a half dollars into our sales tax revenue. I don't think it'll be quite the same you that happened in 0809, but I also don't know that I can be strong enough to say that it won't be somewhat of a you. I think we're gonna see a slight decline this year. We're gonna see a further decline into next year, a slighter decline, and then starting to rise up to what would be normalized spending. Doing that, it's still gonna take us quite a bit of time. A minimum of four years, even in the best case scenario of that quick V that we'd like to see. Um, or it could take us up to six or seven years based on these numbers. Again, 100% right, Councilman Jacob. This is something we've never seen before. 2008 was something we'd never seen before either. So we're really going to have to fill our way through this. Um, this is the sales tax diversification for West Jordan only. We receive 50% of our revenue from the state sales um, and then 50% of our sales tax revenue from businesses that are. Um, established in West Jordan and paying sales tax in West Jordan. I get the question all the time, how much of our sales tax comes from online sales? We get 16% of our sales tax revenue diverted to us from online sales, which tells me overall statewide, that's pretty much it. So 16% um, of the sales tax revenue comes from that online sales component. We anticipate that's going to increase as people uh, have been sheltered in place. Um, we're seeing groceries obviously increase um, and we're seeing everything else for the most part decrease. We won't have any numbers for March until the end of May. So all of this is talking with other directors and um, trying to come up with the best guess. So what's gonna happen with our general fund revenues this year? So that's this year and through now through June 30th. Um, what we've seen is, is this is historically where we've been, and this blue bar right here for 2020 was where we were on when I reported to you last on March 11th, what I anticipated. The budget was, you know, we were coming in ahead of budget, um, sales tax was coming in strong, it continued strong through January. Um, and of course, we're going to see a decrease here this last quarter, so that green line is that loss that we believe that we'll see. This is kind of the numbers chart as to what we believe or what we've adjusted. So you can see the fourth column over is blue and the column, the third column over the middle column is what we talked about in March 11th. Um, so as of today, um, I've revised the property tax estimates have gone down 
because we've got our final distributions and we didn't have a lot of delinquent tax. So that really has to do with that there weren't that many delinquencies that were paid. Um, sales tax were reducing by $1.6 million for what we would have collected between March, April, May, and June for the impact of COVID. Franchise taxes are the same. Um, license and permits, we've seen some strength come in just in this last few weeks, um, but we believe those will actually come back a little bit, but that's based on our estimates right now. Uh, fees will go down. That's based on a few things, um, some event ticket sales, um, cemetery, we believe cemetery sales will go down um, as people are sheltering in place, not going out. Um, and we also believe that there will be an impact to ambulance revenue because um, people won't be paying for those bills. Fines and forfeitures are going to go down because of loss of traffic citations. No one's out driving, so there's no citations. There's nobody breaking the law that is um, at that misdemeanor level. We know that crime will increase as um, social norms change like this, but they aren't really ones that our courts particularly manage or that we get fine revenue from. And then our other revenues, we needed to decrease our interest income that we would typically get on our reserves. So um, there's a substantial impact there. So Councilman Jacob, this one's for you. Here's your telling the story part. Um, this is the same exact numbers, but just showing you line for line, why did we change our estimates? So again, sales tax for the fourth quarter, we got to decrease it for COVID. Sales tax growth, now it, what was growth is now going to be a decline. Um, again, COVID related. Delinquent property taxes weren't collected. Um, our permits were increased to date. This is ambulance and events, reduced traffic citations, interest income. And um, this is an overstatement by um, public safety for some of our forfeiture grants that we thought were gonna come in, but did not. All right, so that's this year. What's, what's the impact this year? Uh, revenues, what we thought would come in is are gonna be about two and a half million dollars lower than we thought. Are there any questions about this piece of it or comments? Okay. Next year's budget update. So um, right now, my assumptions for sales tax for next year are a 15% loss month to month between now and January. Then um, kind of reducing that loss in February as we try and get normalized, and then having an, a loss for that last quarter of about 2%. Overall, the loss will be eased <laughs> to about 7.5%. Denise, is that a, a year over year, month to month number? So 15 to 18% loss in say August, September, October, as compared to August, September, October, the year before. Perfect. Is that, that is? Okay. Yep, Just perfect. Make sure I'm reading it right. You are. So that 10% loss is February of 2020 to February of 2021. General fund revenues. This is similar to the chart we just had. Um, so you're gonna see that those general fund revenues have dropped here. What we anticipated on March 11th for you for a budget for revenues, we knew that we were already gonna be short here. We talked about it, the animal control um, contract that we had with Murray City. We talked about um, some of the grants, the COPS grant that we weren't gonna get. We talked about those on, on March 11th at length. Um, the difference now is going to be that we're gonna drop even further with the sales tax revenue changes. So um, it's really important for us to be vocal with the legislature that if they delay property tax payments in general, that will substantially impact our city's cash flow. Um, and so it's necessary for us to be vocal in that. Denise, am I right in, in thinking that um, there are theoretically bridge loans and things available for cities before that exact? Thing as part of the stimulus or part of maybe future stimulus packages. I hear that's being talked about bridge loans for municipalities. So I've heard um, that there are some bridge loans available, um, but it tends to be to assist in some of the COVID recovery of the community, not so much in the loss of revenue due to sales tax or property tax collections. That could get amended as this rolls out a little further. I, I would think that delayed property tax collections that is specifically due to COVID though it might fall into that. Yeah, sales tax would seem to be the same, right? I mean, 
Well, yeah. Sales tax, at least for the shutdown period, right? Right. Once they allow everything to open back up, if sales tax doesn't rebound accordingly, like you're saying, um, then maybe not that part, but at least for the the defined period that they said, thou shalt not shop. Right. No, they didn't say we can't shop. We can shop online all we want. <laughs> thou shalt not go to hot tub stores. Okay. Thou that's shalt there. shop as much as thou shall want online. <laughs> there you go. All right. This would be general fund revenues for next year. So kind of what I did was these first two columns are those estimates I just showed you that changed. The next two columns are where we were when we talked last. This was March 11th. And then the fourth column over is now how I've revised those estimates. So again, I've reduced property tax by 200,000. Um, again, I don't think delinquent taxes are gonna make up for any of it. I've reduced sales tax, um, license and permits. I've changed a little bit. So you can kind of see, but let's go to the tell the story. It's a little easier. Tell the story. I think we're gonna try and get delinquent property taxes back. I think sales tax is going to continue to fall. We're going to lose about $3 million. Um, permits are going to change. I don't know if they're going to fall, but they won't be at the same level as they were last year. So we need to decrease that a little further. I believe that's COVID related as well as construction. We've already seen a 30% decrease in construction in this last week. Um, franchise taxes, I didn't change at all. I increased our fees because I'm hopeful that we can get events back online ambulances will trend back normally and those kinds of things. Hope that traffic will normalize, so brought that revenue back in. We do have some opportunity to recover some administrative fees from the RDA, so I brought that in. And, um, and then we have some uh, new, new public safety grants that the police identified as, as we met this week with the, or last week with the police department and they gave me some of their grant numbers. So while it could be worse if we didn't have that bottom section that actually gained, um, we will be short about $2.2 million more than we had anticipated originally. So this is kind of where we are and where we were, right? So on this side is overall expenditures and revenues. March 11th, we knew we already had a $5 million shortfall. <clears throat> changing all of those numbers to April 1st, we now have an $8.4 million shortfall. You can see that we've already adjusted the personnel costs down from um, what we anticipated on March 11th. On March 11th, things were going well. We thought that, um, well, cost of living increases were, um, were there and were justifiable. However, the market's changing, has changed that tremendously, and we have removed that from the budget. So there is no cost of living adjustment for personnel in here. We removed all the merits and step plans um, from here and just funded salaries and personnel as they currently exist right now today. Um, we asked everyone to go back and um, Oh gosh, I can see one of my charts. I'm sorry, these numbers got mixed up here. I was scrambling at the last minute to do these. Um, but the numbers at the bottom are right, and I apologize for that. These are allocated wages that would go out to um, other funds, and so they should have been moved down here. However, um, that being said, operations is still, we've asked everyone to kind of tighten their belt um, to get where we can be, but there's no way for us to get to um, make up that $8.4 million gap. So pretty much this is what it looks like right now. This is what we looked like already on March 11th. We have done a lot of the work or tried to do a lot of the work that we knew we could do to the budget, um, but we still have that $8 million gap here. What you need to know is that on March 11th, we had a deficit of 8.6% of our general fund budget. On April 1st, we have a $16.3 million deficit. Um, or not million, I'm sorry, percent. 16.3% percent deficit. We've got to figure out a way to make up that gap. So we're gonna need to know from you how much of that deficit you're willing to fund with reserves. 
Um, our reserves right now are about $11 million. However, with the new estimates, we're gonna be dipping into those reserves another $2 million. So it's likely that we may be uh, more at 10 million, maybe even lower. Um, we will be forced to consider keeping at least 3 million of reserves, which means those are off the table for us to even look at. So it means you have between six and 8 million, 8 million is optimistic of reserves that you can tap into to bridge this gap. Um, and we're going to ask you as a council to give us some direction on how much of that gap you want to use reserves for. You hear the state say they're gonna reduce their um, revenues by 10%, but they're going to be able to fill it with reserves. Well, they have a lot of rainy day reserves. We don't have a lot of rainy day reserves. Um, what areas are you wanting us to focus on um, so that we can bridge the rest of the gap that, that can't be taken up with reserves and what other suggestions that we should consider. So we'd like to turn over just a moment to you um, and have you maybe give us some insight. Council, Council members. member Pack. You can just jump in since it's work session. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Denise, for uh, making the adjustments. I'm curious, for us to have a successful game plan in this ever-changing economic environment and living environment day by day, how often could we feasibly revisit current funding levels? Um, for instance, it's nice to have a game plan. Here's what we'd like to do for the calendar year 2020, um, but, but then now we have to adjust it. Is it feasible to be able to adjust projections on revenues and expenditures on a quarterly basis, monthly basis? I mean, wh where does it get, uh, where's the pain threshold of doing it too often? Because obviously right now we can't live in a year budget. We, we've got to uh, look at it from a maybe a quarterly. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? How often could we adjust these funding numbers? That's a very good question. Um, you, can, you can go back to budget amendment at any time. In fact, I've worked for a city where they required it once a month. That was a lot. <laughs> um, but once a quarter is, um, is okay for us to come back and say, okay, well, um, things have come in better than we anticipated them to be. And so now maybe we can um, hire that position that we've said we want a hiring freeze on. Or maybe we now can increase that service level back to what it was before. Um, uh, for instance, um, we could say now that we will decrease the service level for snow removal. I'll just throw that one out there, right? So kind of far away, right? It's a November, December-ish. We're gonna say, well, we're only gonna fund um, for arterials and main roads for now. And um, once it gets closer to October, November, then we can revisit that and say, well, we've received additional sales tax revenue or things have recovered. We want to bring that service level back up. So we are gonna fund more salt or more snowplow drivers or whatever that might be. That's a for instance. That's one of the things that they did in 2008 was they stopped um, snow plowing residential roads. I don't know how much that really saved them, but, um, but that was a response, right? A reduction of service level that you could say, we're gonna come back and revisit that three, three months into the new year and increase revenues. Okay, thank you. Because I, I, I want to understand you can't keep changing things on a weekly basis, and, uh, but at the same time, I'd hate to hold personnel or projects up if things rebound mm -hmm. quickly since this is a virus situation and not necessarily not necessarily an economically induced situation, uh, but also want to ensure we don't overspend and just because we came up with a budget at the beginning of the year, we have to write it out through the end of the year. So that, that's what I was thinking is that quarterly would be the optimum time frame to revisit this. And would you suggest or is your suggestion to be, I don't 
I guess, as conservative as possible in the beginning, and then maybe after that three month mark, maybe revisit some things. Uh, yes, thank you. I certainly don't want to inflict any pain on projects or, or personnel, but recognizing we're all in this together, I'd hate to kick the can down the road. Um, I'd rather be fiscally responsible um, while also recognizing there are pressures on all sides of, of the issue. And, uh, but yes, I think to, to be, I think it behooves us to be more prudently conservative than assuming that we are going to get revenue um, so that we can treat this as any other entity where we'd be budgeting, whether it's our own homes or our own businesses, um, and to be, just to be responsible leaders of citizens. Any other comments or from another council member? Real quickly, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I just want to say it's amazing that in three weeks we have gone from one budget to another and the changes that you made. So I want to thank you, Denise, and I want to thank your staff for all the hard work they've done to make those changes because of the coronavirus and to make sure that our city is well equipped to handle the changes that are going to come uh, due to the tax issues that we'll see uh, once this is all over. So thank you again for your hard work and thanks for taking the time to know that we need to make these changes and they're going to be very important as we look at next year. Thanks. I'd echo Council Member Lamb's comment. Um, additionally, I would be, I'd be really interested to hear from the mayor much more before I, before I were to start focusing on too many things. Um, he's he's closer to it than we are day to day. It's his staff. I would be very interested to hear specific recommendations uh, for how to react from from the mayor's office. Uh, that said, I very much do appreciate the the recognition from the mayor's office that ultimately the council is the one that owns the budget, and this is our policy setting tool. But I would really appreciate any any insight and recommendations that the mayor's office might be able to provide. First, I want to say thank you. Denise has met with almost every council member. There's one more she's going to meet with tomorrow to help share even more details on this, to help you see what has changed. And you guys making your time available and jumping up to the short notice on that to help. It's been very helpful for Denise. So thank you for doing that. So a couple of concerns. I'm, I'm very concerned about the economic development in our city, which is why I've delayed or made it possible, I should say, for people to continue to get permits. We have worked out something where people can start doing them remotely and we're gonna put, start putting that in place this week as part of our change before we made that change next Monday for the soft closure for City Hall because economic development is so important to our city, especially the little small mall pie shops because if they don't make it, after this virus has been contained and we're going forward, they won't be producing like they were before. And that's, that's what's gonna make the big difference in our city. So I'm trying to find ways to keep them alive and going. As a result of that, a couple of things that she had talked to you about on trying to find ways to increase revenue, it's true that doing a tax increase would help bring in some revenue, but when our residents are hurting and have less money, and our businesses are hurting and have less money, it would be very difficult for me to say, we need that money worse than you do and, and to do a tax increase. And, you know, and if we take it just in inflationary, maybe that would be a tax cut. I, I'm not proposing a tax cut either. I'm just saying that that is one that would be very difficult and we're gonna have to look at other ways to fund the city without doing that which means our residents have less money. And as the mayor, I represent the residents, but also as the mayor, I represent all the staff in the city as well. And we're gonna to have to find a way to share that burden across the board. Our staff knows that, and somehow we're gonna to have to work that. And Denise already mentioned part of it. In our original budget, we are considering COLA, we are considering step grade increases. And those are some of the first things that came out. 
And that didn't come from me, that came from staff. And I thought that was good of them to bring that up, to admit that they're gonna to have to help share in this. So it's not going to be easy. And all of us are going to be affected as residents and as city council members and as staff, it's across the board. But we have to make sure we keep the functions going that we can bring the economy back when it's afterwards. And we are in a position to help businesses go forward. And that's why some of the suggestions Zach made, I thought were good on, on releasing or softening the, the temporary sign ordinance. And our economic development department has been looking at that and has offered a couple of suggestions on wording on that. And we're gonna have the, and what the state's doing, I'm gonna be spending a lot of time with the state. It concerns me that what the state does when they make their suggestions is to help people hurts us. When they talk about, let's not collect the property tax for a while. Well, if they don't collect the property tax for a while, that doesn't affect the state like it does municipalities. So I think they need to look at different things and they need to remember that we are under them and they control the money that comes to us and they need to help protect us as we're trying to protect our residents. I'm sorry if I talk too long, but I, I've got some strong feelings in this area that we need to make sure we make keep the city relevant and take care of our residents at the same time, and it's not going to be easy. Um, if I may, um, I've already mentioned this to a few of you, but I'll mention it to the group. Um, I'm fine with taking a 10% cut um, as city council, as a city council member, and suggest that our staff and city council look at taking a cut in our pay for a little while if we need to. I know it's not a big number and it, it's not about the number. It's about saying that we're not gonna ask you to cut if we're not willing to cut. I and mean, this, this hurts everybody around. I mean, personally, my husband's in an industry that's good. We're just ready for it. It's gonna hit us hard. And, but that's still, I can't ask other people to do things that I'm not willing to do. So I wanna put that out there. I know I'm just one of seven of us. This affects nine of us because we have two staff members, but I would like to put that up for discussion to let the citizens know that that's something I'm willing to do, that we can discuss that. And other places that we have to maybe, you know, cut back on, sorry, Zach, but putting in some parks or maybe fixing some streets someplace. I mean, whatever we need to do to come together, it's, it's gonna hurt all of us. I mean, there's not one person that isn't, you can't talk to anybody that's not affected by this one way or another. And the only way we're gonna come out of this is to let it keep affecting all of us, but do it together and you know as little as possible. So we're, we're all hurting as a group instead of <laughs> one person, I guess. I don't know how to put that, but I just wanted to throw that out there. I mean, I don't wanna ask anybody to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. So I'm willing to do that. And thank you, Council Member Worthen, because you reminded me that not only is this a financial strain on our residents, it's also an emotional strain on our residents. And so, as you mentioned, parks, you know, we did close our playgrounds, but we didn't close our parks down because we need them to have a place to go out and go through our parks and on the trails. And I think the events portion of our city is going to be extremely important. We are going to have to find a way to do events to help the residents come together without finding without spending more money because we don't have the more money to do that with so those are some other things that i am looking at well and dirk i don't want to dominate way. that part of the conversation but i did a lot of things when i was with the chamber that were very minimal in cost but still a lot of fun and it was a win-win for the business and the residents so i mean we can have those conversations um, maybe, you know, in a month or even, you know, sooner than later, but there are some things that we can do. It was just with the experience I've had that they don't have to cost the city a ton of money, but then yet the businesses are going to um, flourish as well with it and get some recognition. So let's have those conversations at another point. So I'm going to jump in here. I, I, I have a couple of thoughts. I, I think that you heard, as we went over some of the things yesterday, you heard some of my input and I won't spend any time on that one tonight. I, I think uh, I'm going to echo what uh, Council Member McConaughey said 
is that, and, and I appreciate being looped into the budget early and that we start to get feedback, but ultimately uh, the mayor is going to end up presenting us a budget. And I would like to, as the budget comes to us, like to see uh, his ideas, you have the staff day in and day out to deal with issues like, uh, as we talk about, because I think it's going to have to be part of the budget, reduction in services, and we can guess. The seven of us can guess about the reduction in services and say, oh yeah, we don't want to plow snow, but how much is that going, how much is that going to save us in salt, sand, overtime? any of those kind of things, and we don't know those kind of things, we can, we could, we could hypothetically say, hey, we're going to let, we're only going to mow the lawns and the parks once every two weeks instead of once every week or, or other things like that. But we don't know from a maintenance and, and those kind of standpoints, uh, what the, where the best places are, are those and which one the most cost effective. And I think that uh, I, I'm going to trust that we have smart employees that can help us come up with those kinds of, uh, of things because I don't want to do that in a vacuum. And so I, I'm going to, to, to use uh, council member PAC's uh, sport, I'm going to be on the tennis court and I'm going to lob that ball back over to, to the administration side a little bit and say those are the kinds of things that we're going to need some serious recommendations on because I can I can make recommendations all day long, you know. It's like, but whether they're cost effective, whether or not they're uh, reasonable, any of those kind of things, I have uh, I have absolutely no idea, and I'm I don't want to be in the in the guessing game when we start making policy. Uh, because I think we need the appropriate data and the and, and good data on, uh, you know, and and a whole whole idea of okay and, and and you know we went through some of those things yesterday on, uh, you know, combinations of uh, fees and taxes and other uh, you know changing leases and all those other kinds of things to come up with money. Uh, but, and some of those were very specific. There's a couple other that are nebulous and I don't want to go into this. Um, and I don't want the council to be the ones without any good, uh, recommendations or, uh, a whole list of recommendations on here's where we can cut. Where do you want? Or here's the things that we can do. What do you want? I'd like to see those come from you guys as well so that we can, make an informed decision and not just uh, uh, not just uh, throw throw some darts in the air like I think we never mind I won't go there so Denise you asked a couple of specific questions so I'm just going to answer those specific questions but I'm going to start with Melissa's I agree with her I think that the council and our council staff, it's appropriate that we take a reduction in in our compensation. Um, so I agree with her there and I agree with her other points. You asked about our um, feelings on the rainy day fund. Um, my comfort level is probably somewhere in the four or five million dollar range. Um, as far as other things, it seems like shortly after I joined the council, the discussion about leasing vehicles versus buying vehicles came up and I was given the history and I understand the history of it. But for me, I think that leasing costs, I know leasing costs more in the long run. Um, I don't ever want to see us not have the funds to be able to replace vehicles. So if you went that way, I would want to know that there's a fund so that everybody can know that when the vehicle needs to be replaced, we have money for it. At, at one point, I think the city got to the point where we couldn't replace the vehicles and it became a big problem, which is why we went to leasing. So, but I could tolerate that. I'm open to 
most anything to help us go through. I did like um, council member Pack's idea of, you know, setting this budget that, but then coming back, um, not just when there's an emergency, but coming back, having set times to come back and reassess because hopefully councilman Jacob is right. Hopefully things spring back. I hope he's right, but I'm concerned that I already know in my own family, a lot of people are out of work. My husband's down to half. So I don't see all of that springing back. And just as we will do in our, in our city or our corporation, we will look for efficiencies. And in a corporation, when you found a way to be more efficient, when this passes, you're not going to then go out and say, oh, well, we'll be less efficient now you're going to keep those efficiencies. So I think it's going to be a spell, but I would appreciate going back. So um, then any other ideas that you have, I'm willing to entertain. Thank you. Thank you. That is, that's very, very helpful for me to know what the threshold, um, and I'd like to hear from other council members what your threshold for using reserves are, because that also gives us the tolerance level to go back and say, all right, we know we have an $8.2 million gap if the council says we're okay with between four and five million, four million, I'm seeing it from Councilman Green, then we know what kind of work we need to do on the staff side. I kind of gave you my two cents yesterday, but uh, they, it's basically where it was yesterday. I mean, rainy day funds are for rainy days, and this is the rainiest of days that we're going to see. So, oh God, um, I hope so. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's going to get much rainier than this. So, oh man, yeah, <laughs> we'll say that. Um, so, Councilman Jacob, is it up? Uh, is the is the number for you between four and five? Y yeah, at least. I, I guess it depends on what that final number is that's available. Obviously, we need to keep that five percent. I don't know why we need to keep that five percent if we're not allowed to use that five percent in the rainy day. What's the point? Um, probably mostly for that service as well. Yeah, I know. I know that's a good chunk of it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my, that's, that's my thought is, is depends on how much is available totally, but I, I'd be willing to use up to, let's just throw this out there, 75 to 80% of whatever it is that's available to us okay. to use. I'm willing to use for the next fiscal years. Okay. Budget shortfall. Council, Councilman Pack. Thank you. I appreciate right. that. Yes, I, to, to me, having a savings account, that's why you have a savings account so that you can use it if needed. Uh, I also wonder, and cer certainly hope we don't need to, but if we have to go through a bit of this again next year, um, just because we might not totally squash the, the, the problem in, in the world. And so I'd, I'd be hesitant of going 70 to 80 percent uh, because then next year could be even worse if we have many workers out of work or going half time um, so I, I wouldn't be as comfortable going quite as far but but certainly dipping into savings um, with regard to the conversation of taking a lower compensation um, I'm, I'm certainly amenable to any and all action. I want to have an open mind while also recognizing that for city council members, uh, let's just throw the number out of 10%. That's a lot less money and it's not our primary income. Whereas if, if we are saying that uh, you know, council and council staff and, and everyone should be taking a 10% pay reduction, you know, we're, we're talking with people's li livelihood there. And of course, that's a much larger amount um, of, a, of a decrease. And so I, I'd want to be careful of what we would be doing there. Um, so, so yes, I, I don't necessarily just want to throw out 2 million, 3 million, 4 million. I'd still like to see what the budget projections are. And I ran on certain, um, certain topics of public safety, health, transportation, amenities, and so certainly we need to prioritize and ensure that we're doing what's best overall for the, for the general populace. So yes, on both accounts, but I'd hate to uh, just mandate across the board or just throw out a number right here of 
two million. Do I hear three? Maybe four. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so as, as we continue to talk and, and looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, um, we can pin down a number. So thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back in, and and I I think I'm gonna kind of echo what uh, Council Member Pack said. I don't want to go, and and the reason why I'm at four is because we're talking about fifty um, percent, and and some of the numbers we talked about yesterday may have even been less than four. Uh, here's here's my and 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 this is a decision that I'm not sure that we've made yet as a city. But the real question is how much money do should we have in the rainy day fund for a reserve? And I don't think we have that number yet. I mean, I haven't seen any policy documents that I know where we've said, hey, 10 million is a good number, 8 million is a good number. But let's just for, for giggle's sake say that um, – Eight million is a good is a good number for reserves because in case we have a natural disaster and we need to uh, call out extra crews to fix water lines and all those other kinds of things, let's just say eight million is a good number, and we use four million of that this year. Now, what we have to do for next year's budget or succeeding bu budgets is we've got to not only balance the budget, but based on that policy decision, we need to put the money back into the reserves and put it back in. And so if we're talking about using, let's say $4 million, then, then the budget in 2022 really has got to come in at $4 million. We've got to come up with $4 million for reserves or 2 million or something and say then, hey, the next, and then hope that the next council or whatever, uh, it would, depending on when elections are, we continue with that momentum because, but I can certainly see what we're going to do. What we could do is say, oh, now the budget's tight. We don't have any money for reserves. We don't put the money back. And then all of a sudden we're at two or $3 million in reserves, and we have a massive water line break, we have a massive sewer problem, we have a massive uh, something, and now we don't have the money, and then we're into a bonding mess, or then we're into emergency things that don't make any sense. So uh, that's why my, my numbers out of the reserve fund are more conservative, is that I'm worried. It's not that we shouldn't use the rainy day for a reserve for the rainy day. It's the fact that then we've got to figure out how to replenish the rainy day fund. And that, given what our revenue projections have been, that's and what we did this past year, um, even, even with a good year, we were still talking about coming up a little bit short and we're relying on turnover savings and some of those kind of things to break us even. We're running on, we're running on lean and we can't continue to run on that thin of a margin and expect to replenish the reserve. And you're right, there's Councilman Green. Um, even looking back historically for the last six or seven years, you're, we're barely doing anything to replenish reserves or we're dipping into reserves. So we're right on that line and we have absolutely nothing going towards any of our maintenance or capital improvement projects. So it would make it much more difficult. The more we tap into these reserves and if we actually end up using them, the much more difficult it will be for the next year's budget. Well, let me talk reserves real quick. Um, and I've talked to a few of you on the council and I talked to Denise and uh, Mayor Burton today as well. In my two years on the council, we have never talked about keeping reserves or having reserves, they just happen. And in years before I was on the council, the reserves were there as well. I think each year that I've observed and watched the budget process, we've used between two to 4 million from the reserves. And it looks like those reserves are gonna be gone. And then here we are, let's say seven years later, those reserves are still there. I'm not concerned this year of using 4 million of the reserves because my feeling is that by this time next year, those reserves are gonna be back up to eight or, or eight, nine or 10 as they have been. Now I get it, you don't wanna use reserves for balancing the budget every year, but we have been doing it 
and every year that money never gets used and the reserves are always around 10, 11. I think one year was at 14 million. Is that right, Zach? I don't, I don't know if it was at 14 or that high, but it seemed one year was really high. Um, do you remember? Yeah, Denise has the numbers better than I do, but that sounds. Yeah, so those are, those are there to use. Like Zach said earlier, this is a rainy day. <laughs> this is the rainiest day that I've ever seen in the city of West Jordan, and um, so you, everyone else has said their numbers before. I'm 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 at the four million mark of using those. That money is the citizens' money, and it should be used to pay for citizens' needs here in our city. Council Member Pack. Thank you. So, if I'm understanding correctly, just to use an analogy from. Council member Lamb, correct me if I'm wrong. Let's say that you're employed and you aren't claiming exemptions. And so you are having more taxes withheld from your paycheck than necessary to ensure that you receive a tax refund as opposed to having to pay income taxes. It, it, is that what you're kind of saying, Council member Lamb, is that because we've done a good job year over year budgeting financially conservatively that revenues have actually exceeded the expenses and therefore we are organically replenishing the rainy, rainy day fund without actually needing to have a line item budget to replenish it. Well, let me use some fake numbers out there. So let's say last year we used 2 million from the that fund, but then this year comes along and now we have 2 million more. So a lot of times what I've seen happen is we're, we're putting that money towards the budget to balance the budget and saying, okay, now it's going to replenish or it's going to take out money from that fund. But then at the end of the year, it always seems like that money's right back in. So I think you're right, Dave, when you say we are conservative in our spending, we're not overspending. And then there's times in corporate we kind of test this where we put money towards something and then we don't use it. And so that money ends up in that fund at the end of the year. So I think this year, yeah, there is there's a greater chance that won't replenish because of taxes and coronavirus, but that's what it's there for, is for us to balance the budget in times where we know that the taxes are going to not be as strong. And that, and that is true, but um, let me speak to how those savings have come about. It hasn't typically been that revenues have been budgeted too conservatively. What's happened historically in the city is that there have been a lot of vacancies in employment. That's not a trend that we're seeing going forward. So um, you've done a really good job of building an executive team to make a city where people really want to come and work. So it has not been in the past where you've been able to have say, we don't have a vacancy in our police department or we don't have a vacancy in our fire department. Our police department, when I last ran the numbers, had two vacancies, two officer openings, and the fire department had one firefighter opening. In the past, you've had 10 police officer openings or 12, and you've had five or more firefighter openings and they were just trying to recruit and keep staff. You're not in that position anymore. You've created a culture where you have a strong city, you've created strong policies and your performance levels have increased tremendously. And now you're fully staffed for the most part. So that's going to take up some of that capacity of savings that we have recognized in the past. And typically it has always been that it has been um, vacancies under the personnel line that's given us that savings. Council in the past, if I may jump in, um, we have also used, um, used those turnover savings to replenish that uh, rainy day fund, that reserve at the expense of not doing capital projects, not putting money toward um, a reserve fund for vacation payouts, uh, sick leave payouts when there's employment turnover, and it's required us to hold positions vacant just to make sure the, uh, the, the payouts uh, of accrued sick leave, of accrued vacation leave are occurring. We're also underfunded on our reserves for risk management. So, um, I would be very, very cautious about relying on those reserves too much um, if we're not structurally balanced in making sure as much as we possibly can that our revenues, our ongoing revenues match our ongoing expenditures. That reserve fund, you can only tap into that one time. It's one time money and then it's gone. And then you've got the same gap the following year. 
if we haven't found a structural balance. So we need to be cautious with that and just keep an eye to that. I agree, if ever there was a rainy day, this is it. But uh, relying on that rainy day fund in a large degree, and if we don't recover very, very quickly, the next year we've got to make up the revenue or decrease the expenses by whatever revenue drops further, plus the amount we relied on the rainy day fund. So it can, relying on the rainy day fund can compound our issues the following year if we're not careful. That's all I have um, for this evening. If anyone else has any other comments, Thank you for your time. I appreciate all of the work that you put in. I know that these are hard decisions and um, just know that we're working hard on your behalf and on behalf of the residents to make sure that we give you a responsible budget at the beginning of May. So we'll look forward to continuing those communications. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are no other comments, I will conclude the work session. And the next item on the agenda is adjourn. Okay. Council Member Worthen. I'll second it. <laughs> we need a motion first. A motion. Second. To conclude the meeting. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion from Council Member Worthen and a second from Council Member Whitelock. Any discussion? Group hug. Non debatable. <laughs> non debatable, but we, we historically ask. Um, let's go ahead and vote. Actually, we don't need roll call for this one, do we? No. Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We stand adjourned. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone.